Dr. Hill said, I am Christy Harris, um, and I'm delighted to be here with you this morning and for the next four days. Um, I also want to thank each and every one of you for being here. I really, being a teacher myself for 43 years, I really don't think there's a harder working group of people than teachers. Um, here you all are on your vacation, giving up a week of your time so that you can help your students learn to be better readers. So thank you so very much for giving of your time just for your students to help them be better people and to make such a fabulous impact. Um, we hope we're going to teach you lots that you don't know um, that you can take back and use in the classroom right away. To begin with, I'm going to ask for you um, to take out this particular book. It has Marion University on the front. And this is, you, know, you noticed you had a few um, materials in there, uh, manual types. Jamie and Lacey are going to go over the rest in the bag in just a minute, what's in the bag and what we use for what. But basically, this particular manual is a supplemental document manual. And if you think of it almost like worksheets. <laughs> We used to hand out all of these extra documents, and we, it just got to be way too much to hand out all of these things. And then with all the virtual people, we just decided to put them all into a nice little um, notebook here. So to begin, if you would turn to page three, and on page three and on the back, page four, there is a knowledge survey. I'm going to ask you to take about five minutes to complete that. And please know if you don't know the answer, you can just leave it blank. Um, and you can say, oh, well, this is something I'm going to learn this week. <laughs> because everything that's on the knowledge survey, we will be covering this week and a whole lot more. Um, but it, it's not a test. I know as teachers, we all get nervous. Oh, no, who's going to look at this? Is this a test? We're not going to look at it. It's just for you to see where your knowledge is beginning and then where it will be at the end of the week. So if you just take five minutes to fill it out, and like I said, if you don't know an answer, just skip it or put a question mark. Okay. Each day, we'll, we will start by going over the answers to the questions for the material that we covered the day before, okay? So you can edit your work at that time if need be. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Jamie now, and she's going to go over the rest of the things that are in your blue bag. Hi. Um, everybody should have gotten a box of uh, materials, or if you, you're here, you've got a little bag of materials. I, we wanted to go over these particular materials because I, we didn't do that last week and I think it would be helpful. This is what you should have. Um, we are giving you a quick phonics screener or the cute, it's not quick, it's really a slow phonics screener, but um, along with that you are going to have inside your uh, quick phonics screener um, this RAND test which we'll talk about a little bit later. It should be tucked in there. Um, and we are going to be referring to these two books throughout the training. Um, like I said, this Educator's Guide is a book that we are using to refer to um, about Orton Gillingham. Um, there will be times that we'll say, check this page, this is some good information. Um, one thing you're going to find out is that um, if you've been trained in Orton Gillingham at any time, there's um, 
a hundred different ways of doing it. And everybody has their own perfect way. I've been trained, I've been to about three different trainings and everybody does it different. Doesn't mean one's better the, than the other. You gotta have to, um, you'll, you'll see. So you're gonna have this book and then you're going to have this particular manual which is our supplemental documents. It's got the little picture of Marion on the front. Um, and these are things that we are, um, we've put together uh, that we think would be helpful in the training. And the other object is you have something called a blending board that looks like this. And we'll explain a little bit how to use the blending board. Um, it's a really nice little uh, uh, thing to use. It's got a little whiteboard here, and, you can, and if you're working one-on-one -on -one or a small group, this is fat, well, actually a whole class. Um, this is fabulous. I'm going to be um, talking to you from the standpoint. I, I teach. I'm right now. I'm teaching regular third grade, so I teach Orton Gillingham in my regular third grade, and I did it in my when I taught fourth grade before. Even during, even during e-learning, we did um, Orton Gillingham um, with the kids. And so I'm gonna kind of come from that standpoint um, so that if you are teaching whole class, I'm gonna give you some different ways to use Orton Gillingham whole class. Um, we all, you also get a, got a very nice plastic container, container of uh, Orton Gillingham cards. And those were made by our wonderful support person, Lacey, and she's going to come up and explain the cards because she knows them better than anyone else. <laughs> I dream about them sometimes. It's, it's become an obsession. Okay, so go ahead and get out your plastic box. I just kind of want to, I, I want to go through kind of what the decks are and what they're called. So if you can find the big one, that the largest set is called the picture deck. And you should have a baggie in your box with some rubber bands. So you might want to get those out because we're going to go ahead and open up the decks right now and put them in rubber bands. So grab a rubber band and feel free to look through your picture deck if you want to for just a quick second. It's basically the the grapheme for the sound and there's a picture. The backs are blank of these. Just kind of want to, I, I want to just show you what they look like. So take this picture deck, get it unwrapped and stick it in a rubber band. All right, your next deck to take a look at is called the Basic Blending Deck. This one has a couple green cards at the beginning and some blue cards at the end. And we're gonna talk about all these later, but for right now, you can just open this up and get it all rubber banded. For the in-person people, if you set your if you set your trash to the side, I can come collect it in just a minute. No problem. While you're doing that, I want to talk to you just for a little bit about the first green cards. So this is just a little diagram that tells you the information that's on the back of each card. This is just the intro card. And we're gonna get into more information about what, what these actually mean later, so don't worry about that. But in case you forget it, it's all right here on this first card. On the back is some thanks and some contact information. These are the markings that will be, that'll be shown in the deck. So you can see the marking with an example of a word 
And then there's a big table of contents with all the keywords. So we're going to go through those um, this week. The last deck is called your supplemental deck. And this one is going to need a little wiggling. So grab this last one, the supplemental deck, and you'll see, you'll see that all the pictures are on the back. So when you open it, separate all the illustrations because the way that the, the way that the printer printed them, the illustrations had to be put at the back, so they're out of order. So if you look at the back of your illustrations, you'll see the card number, and you can put them back in order in the supplemental deck where they go. It looks like we may be missing a few supplemental decks, so if you're missing one at home, TJ sent the link. So TJ will send a link to, to everyone at the end of the day. If you're missing any of these materials, just click that survey and mark what you're missing, and we'll make sure you get that. I don't think we'll be going much into the supplemental deck today, so we'll, we'll be all right. So once you get those um, cards sorted back where they go, that should be it for me. Um, I wanted to tell the, my friends in person, if you have a question during the day, you can go ahead and raise your hand if you want them to address it, if you want Jamie and Chrissy to address it right away. Um, if you have something that you don't feel like shouting out loud, there should be some post-it notes in your box. Feel free to write a question on a post-it note and just kind of give me some evil eyes over here and I'll come sneak around and grab your question. Um, people at home, if you have a question, feel free to send me a direct message or send TJ a direct message, or you can just type it in the chat so everyone can see. It's up to you. Um, and we'll be going over questions kind of as we go through the day. All right, you ready to get started? Great, let's go. Okay, don't get too overwhelmed by the cards. We'll be going through those as we go along. I'm gonna go over some important terms with you. This is from the Orton Gillingham uh, Educator's Guide. Looks like this on page 20 and 21. And um, some of this is important for, for what we are gonna be talking about. Some of it we, is not as important, but I wanted to kind of go over the meanings of some things. Um, if you look at this page, page 2021, it talks about some basic language study terminology. And um, some of this, I think, is important and um, probably needs a little bit of an explanation. Um, we're going to talk about language and language is a rule-based uh, system of symbols both uh, um, spoken written and ideas um, and the next thing is that the next two are grapheme and phoneme this is important a phoneme is the smallest unit of sound you can experience a phoneme with your eyes closed the um, and a grapheme is the symbols that stand for the phoneme. So, shh is a phoneme. The symbols or the grapheme for the phoneme shh is two letters. So, it can be that you, it is um, more than one letter standing for a phoneme. The series of letters, for instance, I'm going to just say I-G-H, is a grapheme for the sound I. Even though it's three letters, it's one sound. My kids love, more than anything, four letters, one sound. E-I-G-H hang A. So that is the grapheme for the phoneme A. Okay. That is important because we'll be referring to phonemes and graphemes throughout. Uh, 
Um, phonics is the next one. Phonics is the system of associating letter symbols with speech sound. That's what we're, that's a lot of what we're going to do is talk about phonics. Phonetics is the scientific study of speech sounds. And then we're going to go over here. Phonology is the study of the sound system of language. Um, if you know anything about Greek, um, the PH O N O talks about sound and ology is the study of. And then the next thing is morphology, which we're going to talk a little bit about. And morphology is the study of morphemes, which is the smallest unit of um, meaning. When we talk about um, morphology and morphemes, if we look at the word cat, that is a morpheme for that little animal with the pointy ears. I'm going to add a whole different morpheme at the end, and it changes the meaning. That's two morphemes. That is a morpheme that means um, plural or more than one. Okay, so we're going to be talking a little bit about morphology, the study of morphemes. Um, also in um, the terms that talked about free morphemes and bound morphemes. Um, free morphemes stand by themselves and they don't need anything to make a word. So if I had the word um, um, do or if I had the word cat, I don't have to add anything to make it a word. But if you take a morpheme like the uh, prefix re, it cannot stand by itself. That is a bound morpheme. Or the Latin struct really isn't a word that can uh, stand by itself. It is the last Latin root. Okay, so that's the difference between free morphemes and bound morphemes. And when we talk a little bit about morphology, I think day three, you will get an idea of um, free and bound morphemes. Um, Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about reading science. Okay. Okay, the science of reading. Okay. Okay, when we talk about the science of reading, we're talking about what science have t had, all the research that people have done over the years to figure out what is the best way to teach reading. Um, up until about um, 1999, there was a lot of research that uh, that was conflicting. So in 1999, the um, U.S. Congress uh, put together a panel of experts called the Nat National Reading Panel, and um, they looked at a lot of different research, qualitative and quantitative. And when I talk about quantitative, what we're talking about is um, research that has data, that randomized controlled trials, which is the gold standard of research. And they looked at, they looked at uh, a lot of different studies and did a meta-analysis of uh, all of that kind of research. To see if it's good research, and when you're doing research about something, you do this really cool research and you say, well, I think this is really good research study. I'm gonna submit it to a journal, all of those journals. And um, at the journal, they have a panel of people who are, um, it's called peer review. And when they look at all the research, they say, well, this is a good study, um, a really good study and it proves something interesting. So um, let's go ahead and we're going to publish that particular research. So if you're a researcher, you really like the idea of getting published by a really good um, journal. As after it is um, in the journal and people see that researcher goes, I wonder 
I'm going to do a slightly different version of this research. And so after time, there's a lot of replication of that research. And if that research kind of plays out and everybody does research and goes, yeah, that, that, that is true, we say that's the convergence of evidence that this research is valid. Um, like I said, the National Reading Panel did 10,000 studies on phonemic awareness, phonics instructions, fluency comprehension, teacher education and reading instruction, and computer technology and reading instruction. And this is what they came up with. Okay. They, they went over a lot of different questions and what they found, um, like does instruction in phonemic awareness improve reading? I'm not going to go over every, every one of these, uh, these particular questions, but what they came up with, and you all probably know this, is that there's five critical components of teaching reading. These are the things that need to be done taught directly. Phonemic awareness, phonics, vocabulary development, reading fluency, and reading comprehension strategies. These are the five things that this particular panel came up with as the critical components. Um, what they found for phonemic awareness that it's beneficial for kindergartners and first graders and those that struggle with reading. Recent research has shown kids that are still struggling um, in the upper grades, a, a lot of times it's phonemic awareness where they fall down. All students benefit from this instruction and doing it in small, moderate amounts is what you need to do. You're not going to do an hour-long phonemic awareness instruction for kids. Um, phonics. Phonics, they found more than anything is what really, really, uh, the research says, really does work. It must be taught systematically and explicitly. Um, it's best taught in kindergarten and first grade. You got to start it there because if you start it in third grade, it's a little more difficult. So you need to start teaching in kindergarten and first grade. That doesn't mean you stop after first grade. It's just when you begin. It fac facilitates learning to read for other children. Giving smart kids information, because a lot of kids, you throw them in a closet with a pile of books, would be able to learn how to read. We all know those kids, and you're just amazed by them. But if you give them a little information, they can really soar. This is good for everyone. And phonics is a relationship between graphemes and phonemes, like I said. Um, fluency, children benefit from guided oral reading with feedback, reading out loud, having somebody help them make sure they're saying the right words and not guessing. Um, they, this, um, they really benefit from modeling. Those read-alouds that we've gotten, um, gotten rid of in some instances are really important. And then repeated readings for fluency. Um, vocabulary should be taught directly and indirectly and in context with multiple repetitions and be, can be taught through incidental learning. And finally, comprehension, which we all know is our end goal, comprehension, that you, the kids benefit from cons, comprehension strategy instruction, and it all depends on good word recognition, fluency, um, vocabulary, world knowledge, and verbal reasoning all goes into comprehension. Now, people have said, well, that, that all the National Reading Panel, that was um, like 21 years ago. But most of the studies since that time have gone on to, to prove what the National Reading Panel found out. So all those studies since then um, confirmed all of what the National Reading Panel fall found out. Um, and finally, I think this is important for the kids that we work with. This is what research tells us about intervention. Poor readers don't catch up without intensive intervention. They're not going to do it on their own. After fourth grade, intervention is very expensive and difficult because you're talking about kids who are angry and a little bit um, and if you ask them, they hate reading. Um, 
children who are at risk can be identified in kindergarten. I think that's the biggest thing. We are not going to wait. Um, my niece had a little girl who um, I, I, I tend to diagnose kid, little kids um, pretty early on, but um, she was worried about her daughter and she had her tested before she went first day of kindergarten. And um, yes, she is dyslexic. And so my niece, uh, she lives in small town Alabama, and so she went and got trained so that she could work with her daughter because there was really no one in her area that did Orton-Gillingham. It's made a real difference with her. Um, intervention is most effective in the early grades. If we can get kids up and reading by the end of third grade, it is a really good thing. Excellent teaching along with small group and intensive instruction can prevent reading problems later on. So that's, if, if, if you've ever seen this one, this is called the Scarborough Reading Rope. Good instruction integrated together to produce a skilled reader. We've got to make sure these kids, if you look at this particular um, visual, have the background knowledge, vocabulary, language structure, verbal reasoning, literacy knowledge that goes together with word recognition, which is the phonological awareness and decoding and sight word recognition. They all to go, go together to make a skilled reader. Um, that is what we're trying to do. We're going to help you with the whole word recognition piece, which for most kids is the biggest stumbling block for them learning to read. Um, I have a definition of uh, science reading. I'm not going to read over this. But um, it's kind of been popular lately, and um, it's important to realize that the whole goal of this is to look about at what works and try to make sure that we give the kids the instruction that science has proven works for them. So that is reading science. Oh, we have a question. Uh, I, the question uh, that's come off, um, and we'll be getting questions off our, um, our feed, can you chat a little bit about ELL regarding the science of reading? And um, we did a project um, early this summer where we went and worked with a faculty and taught them Orton-Gillingham for um, their uh, summer school, and then it was a primarily um, e ELL group of people, and we learned a lot about those kids. And what one thing we learned is that it was very, very helpful for them to learn Orton Gillingham and learn the individual sounds. It's also what we found is, what we were very surprised is that we had fourth graders and fifth graders who didn't know all their letters in English and didn't know all their sounds in English. So we, we really worked with them on teaching them. And they made a lot of progress. The, you know, summer school is not very long. But we're hoping that as time goes on that they're going to be able to um, make gains because they're starting to learn what they need to know. Um, uh, there is a lot of questions about what works with kids who are at ELL um, because I know this because there was a lot of questions that we had as we went along and there's a lot of controversy like what works, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. So that's uh, kind of a struggle is finding that information about kids um, from this background but are just our small little uh, population that we worked with and the kids are really very cute and very fun and they were very excited and, and um, open to learning the sounds that I that Orton Gillingham and phonics does work for them and we're gonna hope that it works for them in the future so any other question okay guess I already have it right <laughs> okay My clicker's not working. 
What a surprise. Clickers so often don't work. Um, I want to point out something before I start. I'm going to talk about dyslexia next. Um, and on your schedule here, you will notice um, the OG Educator's Guide, which again is the one with the teacher and the children on the front. There are pages 4 through 11 there. I am not going to go through very many of those pages with you today. I'm going, because most of it is on my PowerPoint, so I'm going to stick to the PowerPoint. But I, um, you, you'll get homework each night that TJ will send you, and it says to go over and review all of the pages in the manual as well as in the supplemental document. So you might want to mark on there that you definitely want to read um, pages 4 to 11 at home. And there's a, a lot of really good information in there about the brain and how the brain learns. Um, okay, so for dyslexia, All right, so what does dyslexia mean? In general, very simply, difficulty with language. Um, people who have dyslexia have a difficult time processing language. However, that being said, everybody who has a diagnosis of dyslexia is a little different. I like to say people with dyslexia are like snowflakes. No two are alike. Um, if I have dyslexia, I might have trouble with the written expression component and the spelling component. If Jamie had dyslex has dyslexia, she may have difficulties with the decoding component. Some children have difficulties with all of the components. I often refer to those in my mind as my hardcore dyslexic children because they have difficulties with all areas. Um, they might just have difficulty with um, decoding, and of course, if they have difficulty with decoding, they're going to have difficulty with comprehension. Because if you think, if you take a page of, of text, and if a child, every, for every word they skip over, if you kind of put a hole in the page, by the time they get to the end of that page, there could be 15 or 20 holes of words that they've skipped over. Well, of course, they're not going to have very good comprehension if they've skipped over all of those words. It's hard to put it all together. Um, that's why we need to teach those, explicitly teach those decoding skills, which we will be doing all week. <laughs> um, I have never worked with a child who has dyslexia that doesn't have difficulties with spelling. Um, doesn't mean there aren't some out there, but I haven't met them yet. That seems to be the, um, the common denominator with most people with dyslexia. And I will tell you, I've always told parents, we can remediate the heck out of reading, and we can make a difference in spelling. But it always tends to lag behind the progress that they make in reading. It just is a much more challenging task because there are several ways to spell the same sound. And that's what makes it challenging. Um, we teach finger spelling to help with spelling, which we will get to more in depth later, and it really is a game changer. So, for example, um, if the word is dog, we would tell the children to put it on their fingers. So, I'm going to do it up here. So, it would be d-og. So, one phoneme or sound per finger. And that really does help them get the letters in, in sequence. We'll spend quite a bit more time teaching finger spelling later, but I have found that to be a game changer for kids. Um, some children with dyslexia have difficulty writing, difficulty forming the letters, just the act of forming the letters, and or written expression. They have difficulty getting their great ideas, and they have great ideas because they're very bright people from their head down their arm to the paper. I often tell the story of when I worked at Brebuff several years ago. There was a senior class in film analysis, and 
um, the children were assigned to watch Godfather 2. Well, they weren't assigned, they watched it in class. And um, then they had to write an analysis of that. Well, you either are a fan of The Godfather or you're not. <laughs> I fall in the camp of not so much. <laughs> and of course, since it was Godfather 2, I also had to watch Godfather 1 so that I knew what was going to, you know, the background info. So um, as we do as teachers, <laughs> we spend our weekends planning and doing things. And that particular weekend, one of my many tasks was to watch Godfather 1 and 2. Needless to say, I was not very excited about that. <laughs> so I watched Godfather 1 sort of, you know, as I walked around and did other things. And then I watched Godfather 2 and went to bed Sunday night thinking, mm, I don't know, this might be a little tough discussion because I'm not sure I know everything about it. So of course I got out the cliff notes or something online <laughs> to help me with it. We got to school that day and thankfully all the kids had watched it and Evan watched it with his dad and he had so such rich language to share about it as did the other children. They just went on and on and on and on. And I said, okay, now we have to, after this wonderful discussion, we need to take that time now to go and get these ideas, get our um, scaffolding done for our pre-write done so that we can now take these ideas and put them into a paper. You would have thought I told them we were going to go have a root canal. <laughs> I mean, they were just like, you gotta be kidding. And all of this rich language that they were speaking as soon as the writing piece was involved, it just like shut down. So, you know, of course, thank God they watched Godfather 1 and 2 and I could listen to everything and help direct that. But, um, you know, it just, I just thought at that moment, this is why alternate assessments are such a wonderful idea. You know, if they could just take this and, you know, do some sort of a video with it and or it would just be wonderful. Um, Expressive language speaking. Very often children with dyslexia will jumble things up. Um, my niece is in her 30s now and she has dyslexia. Um, and I say has because you're born with dyslexia and you die with dyslexia. It doesn't go away. Um, you learn how to work around it. We This um, technique or approach that we're teaching you, the Orton-Gillingham approach, really does help the brain better process. But um, anyway, she had lots of things that she said differently. For example, um, she loved sausage. And when she would go to her best friend's house, she and her mother would say, do you want sausage or bacon? She would always say bacon. And her best friend said, why do you always say bacon when sausage is your favorite? And she said, I can't say it right, and I'm embarrassed. She would say sausage. She just couldn't get the letters in the right order. So her best friend said, sit on that bed, I'm gonna teach you how to say it so you can have sausage. And she did, and Morgan still talks about that to this day. Um, she was also afraid of the Easter Bunny, um, which I think a lot of kids probably are afraid of that quiet, silent guy that, or girl who's ever under there who doesn't speak. Um, but she was probably extra afraid because she got her letters a little turned around and called him the beater bunny. <laughs> so a good reason to be afraid of the Easter bunny. I have a child um, at school now who just found out that she has dyslexia in um, March and she came in and she said to me, Miss Harris, I found out I have the uh, uh, um, can and my parents told me that you could tell me a lot of things about it. And I said, well, that is one thing about it right there. <laughs> that is one thing that is hard for people with dyslexia is getting the words out correctly. So anyway, it's, it's fun once they know because I can say, oh, that's a dyslexic moment. You know, once a child knows they have dyslexia and learn to appreciate, you know, that about themselves and understand why they confuse things. Another piece is a receptive language. Um, some people have difficulty with dyslexia with that, having a hard time processing what they're told to do. So you will see it oftentimes people with dyslexia, also people with ADD, looking at their peers after you give directions. What did she just say? Trying to figure out 
what they're supposed to do because they didn't receive that message in the same way that everyone else did. Again, those are all language tasks. Every person with dyslexia doesn't have them all. They have different bits and pieces of them. Um, or could have them all. Oh, I'm hitting the wrong button here. Okay. 15 to 20 percent of the population has symptoms of dyslexia. So if you think of a classroom of 30 that has, there's probably about six students in that classroom that has dyslexia. Very important, I mentioned it a moment ago, but very important to hit upon it again. People with dyslexia are bright. They are at least average to above, they're at least average intelligence and many times above average intelligence. Um, so they are not performing at the level that they should be based upon the specific direction and instruction that they have had. Um, and that's why they need a very specific approach to learn how to read. Um, and children with dyslexia are very often gifted in at least one area. Many in, the, in music, many in art. There are those who are um, gifted in space, um, in spatial activities. For example, my niece. <laughs> um, when it's time to put something together at Christmas time, I would fail that task miserably because reading the directions is ugh, something I don't want to spend the time doing because they don't make sense to me anyway. Pick up this and put it there. So what I do is I just start putting things together and they don't work real well. <laughs> but if I would give it to my niece, she could do it perfectly. A story on me on how poorly I put things together. I bought a snowblower one year and I was so excited about this electric snowblower and I couldn't wait for the next snow. And I put it all together and I went out when it snowed and I was just pushing that thing and boy I looked like the abominable, abominable snowman. I was covered with snow and of course the man at the um, at the hardware store told me it was easy to put together, so, super simple. So I took it back to him and I said, all right, you told me this was simple, not so much. I had more snow on me than was any place in my yard. And he said, well, you put the blower on backwards. <laughs> I thought, of course I did, because that's the type of thing that I do when I put things together. Um, with my niece, I take things over to her and say, hey, Morgan, can you fix this lickety split? She gets it done. Um, so they often, al almost always have a gifted area. Um, also, very importantly, people with dyslexia don't have a primary diagnosis of an emotional um, challenge or difficulty. However, very often they end up with a low self-esteem and having um, emotional challenges because we ask them to go to school every day, eight hours a day, and do most of that day is spent in language tasks. So we're asking them to do things all day long that are very challenging for them. And they look at their peers and they see they're getting it quicker than they are. So very often they do, due to their frustration and discouragement, um, develop a low self-esteem. Some common myths regarding dyslexia is that people have a vision problem and they see things backwards. They don't see things backwards. Their brain processes things backwards, but their eyes work fine. Their eyes are not flipping things on them. It's when it gets into their brain, the brain processes things differently. Another one is that um, more boys have dyslexia than girls or that it only affects boys. That also is not true. Sally Shaywitz's study from the Yale University um, shows that there's an equal number of boys and girls who have dyslexia. Oftentimes, I think in a classroom setting, boys may be more out there because they have more energy or they haven't learned that, you know, if I just sit here, maybe no one will notice. <laughs> and so very often, it, it appears as though there are more with um, boys with dyslexia because they're more obvious in a classroom. Um, I already said that. How is it diagnosed? Um, 
In order to be diagnosed with dyslexia, Jamie and I feel like we've taught for so many years that when we work with a child, we pretty much know if they have dyslexia. However, we don't have the credentials to say that. <laughs> um, it has to be an educational evaluation by a school psychologist or a neuroscientist or a psychometrist and they give various achievement tests as well as an IQ test. And then as they go along, sometimes they will administer other tests as well. Um, but those are the people who can say they have dyslexia. We may say, your child shows tendencies and we would like to have your child further evaluated, but we cannot say that we, as teachers, that they have dyslexia because we just don't have that credential. Okay. We are going to do a dyslexia simulation, um, and the goal of this simulation is to give you a hands-on experience of what it would feel like to be in the classroom if you had trouble reading, like our children with <coughs> dyslexia do. Now, I can promise you some of you won't have difficulty with this task because it always is that way. Some of you are will do a good job on this, and others of you will be like, oh my gosh, this must just be so hard. <laughs> and the purpose is to help you um, understand what these children go through and to develop empathy for those with dyslexia. Okay, I also want to say before we get into this, this morning is a lot of listening. <laughs> Please, please know that that is just this morning. As we go through, don't be thinking, oh my gosh, are we going to be doing this all week? As we go through starting this afternoon, there will be a lot more hands-on and participation that you will actually be doing and partner practices and things like that. So just know that this morning is probably your, your longest period of time. Okay, so um, I am going to try my best to be a tough, not so much understanding teacher. However, I usually fail at that miserably. <laughs> um, but I'm going to try. I'm really going to try to do that. Um, so if I say something that offends you, please don't think, oh my gosh, she's so mean. <laughs> if you would turn to page 35 in your um, supplemental documents, let me put the camera on. So it's this one. Hmm. Not sure what's going on here, but Lacey, can you help me? I've got this up, but I'm not seeing it. Yeah, but I was, tr oh, I guess the people at home can see it too. <laughs> if I hold up the book, it's um, unique. As many of you know from, from remote, where you're working in remote and you're teaching at the same time at home and you're teaching in live person, it's, your brain has to think a little differently. So anyway, it is this book for all of us. And if you turn to page 35, it says a special primer. Okay, turn the page to the next page, please. And you will notice on page one of the special primer, we're going to take a minute and look at these symbols. The symbols that are used in this story are different than our alphabet. This is a new alphabet that you're learning here. So if you look at that one that kind of looks like a spark plug, thank you. Okay, and look over here in parentheses. That letter stands for the letter W, or that symbol stands for the letter W. And then if you, the next letter is, looks like a U, if you look at the word, that U, every time you see this, stands for an I. And then the circle with a line through it stands for a Z. A plus sign stands for an A.
that's okay. Just let me know when to go. That's okay. Is it time? Can I start? Okay. All right. I apologize to those of you in the room, but since those on Zoom couldn't hear everything, I'm going to go back again. Um, the first one that looks like a line, kind of like a, maybe a little bit like a division sign. Every time you see that symbol, that stands for the W. A U stands for the I. The symbol with a circle with a line through it stands for the Z. A plus sign is an A. An upside down um, L will always stand for an R. And what looks to be a backwards L will always stand for a Z. So that word in symbols is wizard. Okay, the next one, that first one with all the dots in it, every time you see that symbol, that is an E. The V symbol will always stand for an L. The one that looks kind of like a girl's face with a pigtail will always be a V. And there we have that E again, same as the first letter. And then an upside down T symbol will always be an S. So that word in symbols is el elves. And then books, that looks like an upside down U for a B. Two maybe not equal signs for our O's. A backward C for a K and an upside down T for S. Okay, so take a minute and study those. I'm just going to give you about 30 seconds to study that because we've been studying this for quite some time. So you know those alphabet letters, right? So just look at that so you kind of get those symbols in your mind. Okay, now here's the trick. There's no cheating. You can't go back and look at these. These have to be in your brain now, okay? Just like that alphabet that's up in the classroom. That's supposed to be in their brain. This is supposed to be in your brain, so don't cheat. <laughs> all right. So here, oh, I can't show you mine because I have all the answers. <laughs> okay, so let's go to page two here. And who would like to read that page? Kristen, you would. Oh, you would? All right, go ahead. Great. Um, are you in all these books? You are busy elves. Whoa. I am impressed. I told you there would be someone here who could do it very simply. <laughs> and she was the first one to raise her hand. Imagine that. <laughs> All right, let's look at the next page. Kristen, can you read that front page for me, please? It says page three on the bottom. You are busy elves, or we are busy elves. We are in all these books. All right, that was pretty good, Kristen. But will you go back to that first line? Notice there's an explanation point at the end. So I need you to get that explanation point, that fluency piece. <laughs> All right, there you go. Good job. All right, Liz, could I get you to read the next page, please? Now, come on, we've been studying that for a while. Sound it out. You can do it. Oh, yeah, good job. All. All right, what, do you, what punctuation mark do you notice at the end of those? Okay, could you go back and read it again and get that question mark, that fluency piece in there? All. Okay. Pretty good. We'll keep working. The people at home can hear you. Repeating what they say. That's what that's what was asked. I will try my best. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you are taxing my brain. All right, Angie. 
we're going to do it. I'm going to have you read, and I'm just going to have you read one line at a time because I think I can remember that much. Okay, I do, I do, I do, Angie read. Go ahead. Look at that heart. I think you can get it. We all like. Okay. We all like being in them. Nice job. We'll have to work on automaticity because that was a little slow, but you got the words. I bet all the people that had wrote their name tags really big are really sorry right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The next page, uh, Melissa. I am not like the other elves. I don't like being in these books with a question mark. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> okay, the next page. Tiffany. Whoa. You don't like being in these books? Why not? Okay, why not? Good, nice job, Tiffany. Okay, the next page. Amy, could I get you to read that one, please? I am the giant in all the books. But I don't like being a giant. But I don't like being a giant. Okay, nice job, Amy. Kelly. <laughs> okay, good job of reading those words, but if you notice after the first word, there's a question mark, so it should be why. Why? Oh, see? Why? Why don't you like being a giant? Why don't you like being a giant? Does it make sense? It doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, on the oh, page... Giants. Why don't you like giants? Thank you. Okay, <laughs> good. All right, the last page, if I could get Amy to read that, please. Uh, I like giants. I like giants. But I don't like... This one always confuses everybody. Stories? See if you can get a clue from the picture. Who's saying stilts? Okay. <laughs> yes, but I don't like stilts. Okay. All right. Who are the characters in this story? The elves and the wizards. What's the story about? Can you give me a little bit more information about what this story is about, besides about books and giants? Elaine is laughing like, are you kidding? <laughs> 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 
that's pretty much all I got. Gi giants and books and maybe some stilts here at the end. Was the problem solved? Hmm, was the problem solved? What was the problem? I was too busy reading those words. <laughs> nope, the problem wasn't solved. Okay, let's take a few minutes here to talk about some feelings that you had. How'd you feel? What were some feelings that you had? Yes. I was really nervous and I found myself trying to go ahead to read, pre-read, so if you called on me, and the one page you called on me I hadn't pre-read. <laughs> <laughs> but I found myself wanting to do that, so I wasn't paying as much attention to what was going on in the class because I was so worried about getting called on and not being able to do it. Okay, Kelly had some excellent points for those of you at home. Kelly said she was very nervous and she wanted to pre-read so that if I called on her, she would know, she would shine and be able to read that. But then when I did call on her for her page, she hadn't gotten to that one yet to pre-read it. And you know what I noticed about you, Kelly? Your foot was shaking the whole time. I do that anyway. Oh, you do it anyway? Okay. <laughs> I thought, no. I ADHD. <laughs> no reason to be sorry. I, I just thought. It was. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I had another comment back here. Okay. Okay. And not maybe being able to know what's going on. Okay. Excellent. Another comment was I was afraid. I'm just repeating it for those online. Um, I was afraid of full blown anxiety. I was using my partners because she was writing it in and I was hoping that would help. I was scared to death to be called on. Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right, Elaine, and that's exactly what our children do, isn't it? Elaine said, I basically just gave up. I thought, why bother? This is too hard, and if you call on me, I'm just going to throw a fit. Because the reality is, for the children who struggle with this, they would much rather be kicked out of the classroom, sent to the hall, the principal, whatever, so that they don't have to sit there and be embarrassed in front of their peers. And so you, you had the behavior that many of our children feel. Great. Others? <laughs> okay, excellent. I shut down and I w was just like Elaine. I quit trying and then it was like, oh my gosh, can somebody help me when she called on me? I'm, I'm not really sure what to do. So, and you notice in a classroom how peers will help others out. And part of that is due to their empathy, but sometimes it makes the other kid go, ah, stop. <laughs> you never know how that's going to work. Okay, one other. Yes. I was so focused on, like, the letters and the words. I was not looking at the illustrations and anything. So when you were like, what was the story about? I had no idea. Excellent. So. Excellent. <laughs> Tiffany, <laughs> Tiffany, right? Lindsay. Lindsay. So Lindsay said, I was so focused on the symbols that that's all I could think about. I didn't see the pictures. I had no clue what the story was about. I was just trying to figure out the words. You guys answered this beautifully because, go ahead. I was just going to say, I missed part of the directions where you gave the code. So one, I was really glad I didn't have a name tag on. Um, <laughs> but also, I spent so much time just focused on the pictures and not on the words because I didn't know the code trying to decipher and then looking at the pictures and looking at the words that when others were reading, I couldn't focus on what they were reading because I was so focused on trying to catch up. Okay, excellent. Um, a participant said that she missed part of the directions and so she didn't really know what those letters meant and she was so focused on trying to catch up and figure out what that next word could be. Did I capture it all? Okay. All right, so you all who shared had very similar feelings to those children who are in our classrooms, those children who don't just read naturally, but who struggle to learn how to read. And that was the purpose of this, is to get you 
give you a sense to be able to walk in their footsteps and give you some empathy for what they're dealing with every single day. And here we all are as teachers, educated, successful. We know we're doing a great job. And we as adults felt that way. So imagine what a younger child feels who hasn't had the chance to be successful in life. And it really, their only success goes with how they're doing in school. And like I said, these language tasks, even though they're at least average IQ, and very often more, they are feeling inadequate, just like all of you were saying. And some just give up. We've had those kids that just give up because it's just too hard. Okay, now, do dyslexic children have that alphabet? in their brain? No. <laughs> I just had to give you a difficult one like that because, you know, you're all teachers. We all know how to read. <laughs> um, but if you look on page 47 in your, um, supplemental documents. This might be more how a child with dyslexia might see things. So, Anne and old is right, but woman, see that it's not quite right, the N and the M, and it's also separated. Instead of baked, the D is backwards. Again, they're not seeing it backwards. Their brain is processing it backwards. Baked, but it says daked. Some gingerbread, gingerbread, but notice that space there. I won't read the whole thing to you, but this is more how a person with dyslexia might see it. If you see the O there for she had, an A and an O are very similar. The only difference is the A has a stick on it. So they may see it differently like that. That's more of how they would see it rather than the symbols piece but I just wanted to show that to you. Um, are there any comments at home? Nope. Just that, that people were feeling like they had a great deal of empathy for their students when they were going through that experience. Great. And everyone was, everyone at home was feeling exactly the same as you. <laughs> and they were saying they were, uh, they were glad that they were not in your chairs. So, <laughs> good job. I everybody. bet they were. Because <laughs> there was no way I could call on you at home. <laughs> okay, so we've already talked about, you know, when you're having this failure constantly, um, it can produce a poor self image. Um, I want to talk to you. No, I think. Let me see. Yeah, let's do this. Um, spoken language, you know, a lot of people, those particularly who subscribe to the whole language um, philosophy, which is if we just immerse the children in enough books, someday they'll learn how to read. And that comes from the fact that we do learn how to speak just by being immersed in the spoken language. That is how we learn how to speak. Um, that is, if you know, we're, our brain is working normally, whatever normal is, if we're just immersed in listening to people speak, we will speak. And that is because spoken language takes place at a pre-conscious level. It's effortless. Why is that? We've been, we have been, man and woman have been speaking for hundreds of thousands of years. We have not, however, been reading that long. So our brain is made so that we can just learn to speak by being surrounded by speak, speaking. But reading and writing are fairly recent. I mean, really, universal literacy has only been in the, like, since the 50s. So in the last 70 years where, you know, prior to that, kids would take off and go work in the fields when they were younger. So really since the 50s, which is 70 years, ago is when we have really worked on, you know, teaching everyone how to read. We've had a written language for about 5,000 years versus 50,000 years for spoken language. So 
spoken language is hardwired into our brain, but there isn't the reading mod module is not. That's why we must teach it directly. As you just saw, we have to take the print um, and convert it into a linguistic code. And if a reader can't do that, which some of you struggled to do, then the, later, the letters are just marks on the page and they have no meaning. Okay, we're going to come back and talk about Orton Gillingham. We're, I'm sorry, but we're taking our break a little early because I'm looking at the eyes in here and there's been a lot of listening. Um, so what we're going to do is move up our break and then we'll come back and do what is OG. Okay. All right. Can I, I'm going to kind of digress a little bit. I wanted to talk before we went on talking about Orton Gillingham about the simple view of reading because this is a a powerful uh, example of why decoding ability is very important because our ultimate goal with kids is reading comprehension. And this simple view of reading was created by somebody by the name of Goth and Tunmer. It's hard to say Tunmer. Um, and research has shown this is exactly true. And I'm going to kind of show you what this means. If your oral language ability, if we were going to go 1 through 10 and decoding ability 1 through 10, if it's 10 for this and 10 for this and we multiply that, your comprehension is going to be 100%. Really, really good. But if your oral language is pretty low, let's say 2 out of 10, and your decoding ability can decode really well is 10, your comprehension is only going to be 20 out of 100. It's a multiplication problem. This is a hyperlexic person at this ability. But if your oral language is 10, your decoding ability is not too good at 2. Your comprehension is only going to be 20% as well. And that is what you call the dyslexic reader. Someone who's got really good oral language, but their decoding ability is very low. And that's why their comprehension is low. When we did our um, project in our summer school, <coughs> what we found is there was a lot of kids that um, they were worried about their comprehension and they wanted to work on their comprehension, but they couldn't read. So there was no use working on their comprehension if they couldn't read. So this is the simple view of reading, and research has shown this is certainly true. So kind of keep that in mind when you're worrying about some kid's comprehension, but they can't read, because that is a, a big important piece of that. So we're gonna talk um, a little bit about Orton Gillingham now. Okay, you will notice on your schedule um, that pages 1 to 4 and 66 in your Orton Gillingham um, Educator's Guide are listed. Those are great pages again to read tonight. Um, I'm covering most of those in the PowerPoint today. Full screen. Thank you. Okay. So, um, there are many different great ways to teach reading and to teach the phonetic system. The one that we're talking about this week is Orton Gillingham. Lyndon Mood Bell is another one. Um, there's a Foundations, which is a reading um, series. It's also very good. Harcourt. Um, used to have one years ago, but anyway, there are plenty of good ways to teach explicit reading. This is just the one that we're talking about this week. One thing, these are the components of it which are so important. The first one is multisensory, which simply means the child is seeing, hearing, and 
feeling something simultaneously. And we'll talk a little later after lunch about Samuel Orton, who discovered the um, multi-sensory approach, the visual auditory kinesthetic approach way back in 1925, and how impactful that was for children learning to read. So for example, if I am teaching the letter J, I guess I can't do both, I would tell the students, this is J, and it says J, and they would say, this is J, and it says J, and then I would have them write it. J says J, J says J. So they're seeing it, they're hearing it, and they're touching it or feeling it in this at the same time. And the kinesthetic piece is the glue that holds it all together. If we just say it, wah, 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 <laughs> it kind of goes in one ear and out the other. But if they actually have the chance to do the kinesthetic, the feeling, the tactile, that's the glue that makes it stick, or the Velcro that makes it stick. It's also phonetic and alphabetic. I'm teaching them this, the letter J says J. I'm not saying this is J. What do you think it says? I'm explicitly telling them the sound that makes um, and helping them understand the alphabet symbol that goes with it. As I quickly did with you this morning, helped you understand the alphabetic symbols, but that was really quick. I would never do that in the classroom with children. Um, it is synthetic, which means you use all of those individual graphemes to decode words. So you're figuring out how to pronounce words or decode words. It's also analytic, which simply means um, encoding or spelling. I'm, I'm teaching them to read and I'm teaching them to spell both. Um, it's repetitive. So if I teach them today that J says J, that's not going to go away tomorrow. That's going to continue to be looped in to my lesson plans so that there is lots of review on that and it's cumulative. Um, and that's another reason that it works, because it's cumulative. It does, it's not taught once and then forgotten. Um, it's cognitive. We speak to their intellect. We use the words phonemes and graphemes. Phoneme, again, being sound, j, and grapheme being um, the letter representation. So we use, we speak to their intellect. Um, it's structured. Um, it's sequential. We start simple. And we build upon that and make, you know, and, and get more complex, just as we will do with your lessons this week. We'll start simple this afternoon with your deck, and we'll get more and more complex as we go through the week. And what I want to say is what you're learning in four days could be well over a year or two or three for students. <laughs> so just know that when we start pulling cards today that you're learning at rocket speed, <laughs> and your children will not learn it at that speed. Um, and then it's diagnostic and prescriptive. Um, in other words, the whole time we're teaching, we're writing little notes to say, okay, so enough children didn't remember this if we're in a classroom setting, so I need to go back and review this, whatever this is with them tomorrow. Um, it's more difficult to do that in a classroom setting than in a small group or one-on-one -on -one because sometimes it's hard to tell if you have 20 kids in front of you who is picking up everything or what. But anyway, those are very important elements of Orton-Gillingham. Um, as I said, the multisensory activates all three channels and it does it at the same time. Visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. Why is this important? Well, first of all, because the kinesthetic piece is the glue, and also it gets information into the strongest channel. So it doesn't matter if our, ch if our children who are sitting in front of us, if one has a stronger visual channel and one has a stronger auditory channel, if we're doing visual, auditory, and kinesthetic simultaneously, we're meeting everybody's stronger suit because they're all going to have one of those, and then we're building and, and strengthening their weaker channels. Um, children must learn the alphabetic principle in order to learn to read. They must learn that letters stand for sounds. Um, the graphemes, again, being the letters, and the phonemes being the sound. 
Um, we talked about synthetic. Um, the research shows that the typical brain, whatever typical is, needs between 5 to 14 exposures with a word to get it stored in the occipital temporal part of their brain where they just read it like this, where it becomes a word that is just there. But some students, particularly some with dyslexia, may need up to 500 repetitions. Um, so you can imagine how much review that you need to um, put into that. It is cumulative. Skills are taught in practice as new skills are hooked on. Um, it's structured. We begin with the Anglo-Saxon layer of reading, and then we move on to Greek and language, and then other languages. And what I mean by Greek and Latin, we move on to the roots of those Greek and Latin parts in the English language, because our language is like a stew. We have pieces of all sorts of different languages in ours, but we begin with the Anglo-Saxon and then move up. Um, we talked about how it's sequential. Okay, this is an important piece of the brain picture to look at. So if you look at the typical reading brain, you see in both hemispheres, the right and the left, um, when the children were put in an uh, MRI, a functional MRI, and given language task to do, reading task, the typical reading brain had both areas in the right and left hemisphere lighting up. Children with dyslexia, you notice, don't have much going on in one of their hemispheres. But then, after they received extensive intervention, the brain began to process that language differently. So it, it kind of retrained their brain how to process letters and sounds and, um, and reading. This came out of Tufts University. There are some unsettling statistics, and that is 60% of America's inmates are illiterate. So just think, if we could make the difference in the classroom, and teach these children how different our society would be and how much better it would be. 85% um, of all juvenile offenders have reading problems. They're the ones, like you, who said, I just want to get out of here. I give up. Um, and there's always another group to go to, as we all know, in schools. Um, OK. It's very important to find the strengths of those with dyslexia, recognize those, and um, build upon those. Help them know that even though reading may be hard, they can get it with the skills that you're going to give them, but they also have all sorts of wonderful strengths. Um, famous people with dyslexia. I'm not going to read those to you, but you can scan those obviously very successful people. And that's just a small amount. I mean, they go on and on and on. Um, and when my children are diagnosed with dyslexia, I let them know this. What I want to do, though, is find younger people who have dyslexia because they're like, who's that? <laughs> um, and as I said earlier in the presentation, people with dyslexia are like snowflakes. No two are exactly alike. Um, one person may have difficulties with reading and spelling. Another person may have problems with the written expression component. Another person with dyslexia might have problems with all of those language tasks. So it, it um, comes up in different ways or manifest in different ways. Okay, are there any questions on what is Orton Gillingham? That was a big overview. There are more details in your manual. Any questions at home? No? Okay. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about phonemic awareness, phonological awareness. Um, these terms are bandied about, and um, I think a lot of times teachers get mixed up. I know I did. What is the difference between each? 
if you go to page 68 in your um, supplemental documents, which is the um, one with the Marion on the front, this, is, this PowerPoint is on there. Um, Hmm. Okay. It's not okay. Okay. All right. Anyway, we're going to talk about the different levels of phonolo the phonological umbrella. This is when we talk about phonological, we're talking about sounds and um, dyslexia. And um, we talk a lot about dyslexia because if you really get right down to it, most kids who have a, a great majority of kids who have a reading disability, it's dyslexia. And um, their problems is, are, can be found in the, um, their phonological processing. So that's a very important thing. That's their main problem. It can be exacerbated by many different things but it has to do with phonological processing. The top level of phonological processing is the ability to know the difference between, that these are different words. If you've ever taught kindergarten, I, I, I tell the story of uh, um, the kids are starting to write sentences and you, you are allowed to give them some words and say, if you want a word, I'll write it down. And somebody goes, can you tell me how to spell, I pledge allegiance to the flag? Um, and, and so that, that child is not quite sure the difference between words. And then it's going to be the um, ability to discern different syllables. And then onset and rhyme. And when I talk about onset and rhyme, I'm talking about, um, eh, is everything to, from the, from the, uh, the, the vowel over is the rhyme, and the beginning is the onset. So the difference between sh, ip, sh, is the onset, and ip is the rhyme, um, or k, at, k, is the onset, and at is the rhyme. That's an important piece. And then the next step is the ability to know, to um, figure out the difference between phonemes. And when we're talking about the difference in phonemes, its ability to blend them and segmenting the different phonemes. That's an essential skill. And then also matching, deleting, substituting, but just be able to manipulate phonemes effortlessly leads to good reading. If we look at these particular ways that I broke these particular words up, um, did I break them up by syllable? onset rhyme or phoneme. If I had h, ow, s, what is that? Phoneme. Great, phoneme. Ro, bot. Syllables. Syllables, good. B, ite. Onset rhyme. Dog, house. Syllables. St, af. Onset rhyme. J, eep. Phonemes, and the last one is sh, ooh. Onset rhyme and phonemes, both, exactly. We talked about the phoneme being the smallest unit of sound and that we have to blend, segment, and manipulate the, be able to manipulate the phoneme. There is a little bit of controversy where um, some people think you don't really have to get into higher level phonemic awareness tasks. But um, and then there's other people that say the reason why older kids are still stuck and having difficulty with learning to read is because they need to work on their phonemic awareness. Um, linking phonemic awareness in reading words. It's a very important begin instruction in kindergarten and first grade unless they already demonstrate an ability um, for phonemic awareness. The effects on reading and spelling intensifies when they're taught letter sounds. Without phonemic awareness, phonics instruction is almost impossible. Okay? 
And you know, Dibbles is, a, is an example of a test that's, that um, tests phonemic awareness, and we're gonna show you another one. Um, uh, today, Christy mentioned the alphabetic principle. This is an essential understanding. If they don't understand that, it's almost impossible to teach them um, how to read. You gotta, you gotta do a lot of activities to get them to the point. Any word that we can say can be broken into individual sounds, and each sound can be represented by letter or letters or grapheme. Decoding words depends on the ability to generate a sound for each letter, blend the sounds, and segment the sounds. If the, here's an, an example of some assessing of phonemic awareness, and we are going to go on from there because I'm going to show you in the quick phonics screener some ways to assess phonemic awareness. Okay. Okay. Go ahead and get out your quick phonics screener. And again, it's not so quick. If you look on page, um, I think it's 28, we're going to go through some parts to this. OK, this is page 28. I, you know, you're, you're not going to remember all of the directions. I'm going to go through this each page so you can see the different task and how it relates to phonemic awareness. On page 28, this is where you begin. It's kind of the highest level. The ability to do, to, um, do some phoneme manipulation. Um, you're going to tell the kids, we're going to play a word game. I'm going to say a word. I'd like you to repeat the word. Then I'm going to give you directions on how I'd like you to change the word. Please say the new word. So this is basically, and you give them a demonstration, say slip, class, say slip. slip. Okay, change the p to k. What's the new word? S slick. That's a, that's a pretty high level phonemic awareness task. Um, is, as you can see, this is untimed. And um, if the, the student scores less than seven, they proceed to phoneme seg. Fluency. Now I'm going to tell you, it's easiest to change the first sound, and then it gets more difficult as you go along. Um, the most difficult is probably splitting blends. I don't know if they even have splitting blends here. Um, for instance, like saying slim, change the l to w. What is it? Swim. That, that's the, the highest level of phonemic awareness tasks. Um, so you, you, go, you would go to the first one and say, say box. Change the b to, and what's the answer? Okay, so that is the first one. If they do pretty well on that, you're going to go straight to the sound assessment because we're saying, oh, they're 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 pretty good in their phonemic awareness. If not, you're going to go to the next one, which is so phoneme segmentation. Um, this is a a little uh, more difficult because. Um, it's a timed test, OK? And you are going to say to them, we're going to play a word game. I'm going to say a word, and I'd like you to tell me all the sounds in the word. My word is rain. What are all the sounds? What you find if kids have not done too much with phoneme segmentation, you're going to have to give them a lots of examples, because they maybe have not ever done that before. Uh, particularly with phoneme segmentation, I, I find you have to give a lot of I, um, examples. But what you would do is say, what are the sounds in go? And the kid would say, um, g o. And I make that little um, loop underneath because I set a sound and another sound. So that shows me right away that they did two sounds, OK? The sounds in high. Everybody? Oh, there's two sounds. And we go along, and they're doing pretty good. And what I found that 
after a while, they start <laughs> falling apart, apart a little bit, and you say, all the sounds in up, and they just say, up, and that's only one sound. You want to make sure they mark how many sounds they said. Now, let's say we come to the word feet, and they say, oh, marker bad, uh, eat. Exactly, they got it right. They got all three, so you make sure you mark it by scooping underneath for the number of sounds, okay? All right, if they score um, 30 or greater, we're gonna go on. There is, um, let's just say they didn't do very good on this. They had less than 30, so you want to go on to syllable segmentation because that's kind of the next, the next level. They couldn't do phoneme seg, but let's see if they can do syllable. And what you would do is say, um, my word is basket. I want you to say, we're going to play another word game. I'm going to say a word. I'd like you to repeat the word, then break the word into syllables. Again, you may explain to them what syllables are. Um, so you say, um, tell me the syllables in basket. Basket. And then they go on and make sure you scoop under each syllable. If they can't do this, they're not in really good shape. But the next easiest thing is really to do compound word because they're familiar with the words. And that would be, tell me the words in pancake. And it would be pancake. This is a little bit easier than syllables. And that you go on to phoneme blending, which is um, a task in which you give them the sounds broken down, you got to have a little space between them, and they're going to blend them together and give you the word. You often find that kids either leave off the last sound, or once you give it to them, they forgot the beginning sound. And they ha they're having difficulty a little bit with their working memory, and they can't remember what the first sound was, so you, they, they become very confused. This is a very telling um, test where you're going to have, you say, we're going to play a word game again. I'm going to say some sounds. I'd like you to give me the words these sounds make. And you start with r, a, n. What is it? Rain. Very good. Um, uh, you do an example because, again, they might, might not have had very much um, exposure to this kind of uh, task. You got to make sure they know what is expected of them before you begin because you'll get a, um, they might be really be able to blend, but they don't understand what the task is. So um, then the next uh, little test is onset and rhyme blending. As you can see, this is harder. If they don't do well on this, you're going to go do onset and rhyme, or you're just going to say, let's blend s o. I'm mean, sorry, soap. What is it? Soap. As you can see, um, that is pretty easy, but if they don't do very well, you're going to do syllable blending, where I'm going to give you two syllables, like bass and cat, put it together, basket. If they do poorly on this one, you're going to go to compound word blending. Now, this might be a little fast, but I'm not going to give you the complete instructions. It says right on the page what you do. Okay? I want you to become familiar with, the, with these tasks so that you understand what's expected uh, in, in this particular test, and you're going to see um, a little bit of where your child is that you're testing by going through this. This next one is a compound word blending. Again, it's easier. Let's put cup and cake together, and it's cupcake. You're not going to have very many kids that have difficulty with this, but if they do, their phonemic awareness is not very good. So basically what um, it says, if they can't do this, if a student scores less than 10, stop the assessment. You're not going to be able to really get too much into um, teaching them sounds, the sound symbol, 
because they don't have any phonemic awareness yet. You're going to spend more time on phonemic awareness. Okay? Now, I, uh, you, you guys have not had a chance to look through this. We're going to do our first partner practice where you are going to go through the um, phonemic awareness part of this test, which is our page 28 through 35. You're going to give a few um, to your partner on each one, and they're going to give you a few so you get a feel of how to give these tests. Okay, um, I hope you had a chance to explore that um, assessment. Um, a, couple, a couple of things that we went over. Yes, you, do, you can do this, you should do this with kindergartners. Um, somebody said that they gave dibbles, and if you, if you give dibbles, you don't really have to give this unless it's above the cutoff, because um, dibbles test, test phoneme seg and... Um, and blending and nonsense words until second grade and then they no longer do that and so if you're having a kid that's struggling above that level then go ahead and give this assessment this also kind of gets a little deeper if you have a kid that you say ooh, their uh, their scores are pretty bad on dibbles um, to get where, where do they break down is it at the syllable level is it at the uh, a, the compound word level whatever it, it, it's a, a helpful test and um, one that the reason we're presenting it is because it's on the IDOE approved list. Um, we wanted to go over a couple of phonemic awareness activities to, um, with you today and Lacey who did the cards, invented the cards and created the cards has some cards at the back that are phonemic awareness activities and she's going to come up and do a phonemic awareness activity for you, with you. Okay. Okay. Was if a student says "eat" as two sounds instead of three, is it okay to remind them of the rules in the middle of the test? No. 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 We are looking for automaticity. How automatic are they? Okay. Zoom feedback. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's a bad sign. I need it all. Uh, we'll have to unmute. Okay. So um, there, there's a lot of things that you can, a lot of activities. Uh, we're going to go over a couple of phonemic awareness activities um, right now before we move on. So. Okay. Um, hi. Hi, hi. I feel like I'm just sitting over there hiding behind a computer screen. Okay, so in your supplemental deck, there's no need to get them out now. I'll just show you what they look like and then I'm going to show you some of the games. But they're at the very back of your supplemental deck. And the first one looks like that. So why teach phonemic awareness? It's just a little blurb with some research in there. And then on the back of that is the when and the how. So I did want to say real quick, all of these activities are meant to be done within two minutes. So they're not meant to take 30 minutes because I know it's so hard to find that chunk of time in our day, right? But we all have time on the way to the bathroom or kids coming in or as a ticket to go out to recess or those kind of things. And this, these are just some quick little games that I came up with to help us use that time and to build in some phonemic awareness. Um, feel free to hate them and never use them. That's just fine. They're very silly. If you can tell, my background is with little, little bitty kids. So I mostly worked with um, K2, as you're about to tell, okay? As you're about to see. So I'm not going to go through all 15. I'm just going to go through a few of them so you can hear them. If you want to hear some more, just let me know, and I'm happy to show you how to play the other ones. Okay, one of them is called Pick Me. It's just a rhyming game. It's very simple. So I just would say something like, I'm thinking of someone whose name rhymes with Denry. Whose name rhymes with Denry? It's Henry. And then we would say, Henry, Denry. They end the same. They rhyme. Very simple, right? I have no idea why I started tugging on my ear. I guess because they're listening. 
But they really liked to say that. They end the same, they rhyme. Um, when I first started doing it, I used to say they sound the same, they rhyme. They don't sound the same to little kids, right? They end the same, they rhyme. Okay, here's another one um, called Come On In, Get Out of Here. <laughs> it's, they're all very silly. I got to stop saying it because they're all this. I'm going to have the same caveat on every single card. This one's silly too. Okay, so I say um, I'm having a party for words that have the same beginning sound. If my words have the same beginning sound, you're going to say, come on in. Can you say it? Come on in. If they don't have the same beginning sound, you're going to say, get out of here. Go ahead. Get out of here. Are you ready? OK, let's listen. Map man. Come on in. Yeah, those both have the same beginning sound. Mm, let's try another one. Top tank. Come on in. Bat gum. Get out of here. Those don't have the same beginning sound. You can also play that with uh, words that rhyme or have the same ending sound. You can really level those up for your kids. Um, similar game, BFFs. This one is a song. Which two words are BFFs, BFFs, BFFs? Which two words are BFFs? And then you name the words. So if you're doing beginning sounds, you can say rest, rock, pet. Which ones are BFFs? Rest, rock. Oh, BFFs, right? OK. OK. I feel like you're getting to know me in 30 seconds that I'm up here. This is my real personality. OK, this is a similar one, Take a Trip. It's just an alliteration game. So it's Baby Shark. You ready? Let's take a trip, do, 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 do. Take a trip, do, 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 do. Take a trip, do, 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 do. Take a trip. I'll bring a ball, do, 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 do. And a bat, do, 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 do. And a bathtub, do, 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 do. Do you know where I'll go? I'm going to the land of B, right? You can do, there's two examples on the back, an SH1 and a B. Um, it's a fun one that they like to try to figure out where you're going. Okay, two more real quick, mystery word. So um, these are pretty simple. It's just saying this is, a, I, can you think of my mystery word? Can you figure out my mystery word? Um, there's a scaffold here if you have little kids or big kids who can't who need an extra little hint might say something like my mystery word is something small and it rhymes with mat it starts with a k. what is it cat right so then they have to kind of think through uh, okay it starts with this but it rhymes with this and they have to put it together in their heads um, if they're past that, is something big, something small, something red. If they're past that, you can just jump into, you know, um, the, the second part. Um, okay, and then there's a song. So Old MacDonald's Sound Farm. This is, um, <laughs> there's, all of these are silly, but fun. They're fun. Okay, so um, Old MacDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O, and on that farm he had a b, b by b by bo. With a b b here and a b b there, here a b there a b everywhere a b b. Old MacDonald had a farm. B by b by bo. Okay, there's another one that's similar to this. Um, that's row 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 that crazy boat. Okay, there's a bunch more. There's I think there's 15 all together, and there's different levels on them. Or sometimes they have little scaffolds, so you can take a look um, during your lunch or anytime. Or you can just throw them away. Up to you. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of great activities and books and resources for phonemic awareness. Um, I know that Hegarty is a program that a lot of people are using. They have great resources. Um, I'm going to show you something to do with older kids um, where we're working on phonemic awareness. As you can see, I'm using blocks. And the reason I'm using blocks is I'm, what happens is these kids often just need a placeholder for that sound. And um, I'm going to show you some activities that you can do using blocks. 
Besides teaching in the classroom and doing Orton Gillingham in the classroom, I have individual tutoring students. Right now, for some crazy reason, I have seven. So almost all of them need this. We use, um, they know that we use blocks. Um, I even try to do something like this. I am Zoom, Zoom tutoring of those seven, about three of them, and we still try to do blocks with them. It's not as easy or impactful, I, I don't think. But um, what I would say is this word is sap. Touch and say the sounds in sap, and they would go sap. Very good. Here is sap. I want you to put a ooh after the s. And they think about where, I said, where is this? Oh, it's right here. We're going to put a ooh after this. And now what is it? Oh, it's slap. Okay. And then I have them, always have them touch and say after they do that, because oftentimes they forget what that word is. Slap. Very good. And then I might say, if you were going to put letters on top of this, what would, you, what would the letters be? That would be S L A P. Um, so here is slap. I want you to change um, slap to lap. And so there we go, slap, lap. And that's, that's a hard one. <laughs> and they would realize you take away the S, and it's lap. Here is lap. Change the A to I. Where's the A? Oh, it's right here. I'm going to change it to I. This is, what's the word now? This word is lip. Okay? Here is lip. And then I might say like this. Change lip to sip. Ooh. L-I-P. Now what's sip? S-I-P. Where does the change happen? What oh, happens right here. Exactly. What are you taking away? I'm taking away the U and putting a S. The word is now what? Sip. Touch and say sip, sip. Okay, there's sip. Um, if you have letters, what would the letters be? I would put S I P. The trick with this, you've got to make sure you get really. If you have a, a magic e or whatever, it gets a little more difficult. You don't want to get into magic e and different spellings. Something that's pretty straightforward. So those are some activities you can do with blocks, or you can do it with chips, or whatever, with kids that are a little bit older. Um, um, they still that I'm found. I'm my oldest kids are um, in third grade that I'm tutoring. They still need lots of work on this, even though they're in third grade. So um, I'm going to go to another. Uh, test IDOE asks you to do when you're um, doing your assessment for uh, dyslexia screening and it is a the Arkansas RAN and um, the RAN means rapid automatized naming and um, it looks like this you should have the they have a copy okay it looks like this and this is what it's doing is how quickly a student can retrieve phonological information. Okay? That's what it's testing. This is important because it's a, it is a good indicator of someone who's going to have difficulty with learning to read. You would do this with kindergartners. Um, what, uh, there's different, uh, there's lots of different RAND tests. This Arkansas um, RAND test is free. That's why you're getting it. But, um, there's a RAN RAS. In fact, Acadians has now a RAN test um, because many uh, states require you to assess kids on um, rapid naming. Um, and I kind of go into why. When you are looking at kids that have dyslexia, the major problem is phonological processing. Remember that for the end of the day. <laughs> You'll see phonological processing. But it can be exacerbated by visual processing, issue, visual processing issues, attention problems, memory issues, processing speed problems. All of these things can really make a child have more difficulty than the normal, um, normal child. If you have someone who has a rapid naming issue and a phonological processing issue is called a double defi deficit, deficit 
and it's difficult to remediate. Those kids will have a d more difficult time. Um, there, once you kind of figure out somebody's RAN is really slow, if you look on the internet, it's at, there's things that you say, oh, you can, um, here's some things that you can improve a kid's um, processing speed or RAN speed. It's not true. You can't really remediate that. But it's just good information for you to know, to keep an eye on children who have a difficulty in this area. Um, the test, there's different tests, but there's, um, it's rapidly naming colors, objects, letters, or numbers. On the C top, they have all of those, and they give all of them. But this is just the one we're going to do now. You first of all want to make sure you give them this, and they have to read the colors across to make sure they actually know those particular colors, okay? Once you do that, you're going to give, there's two forms, for some reason I have two tests, hmm, maybe three. <laughs> I probably do, it's like they're having babies. Um, anyway, um, you would give them form A and they're gonna read you tell them you're going to read, um, you're going to say the colors from left to right, and you're going to time them to see how fast they do that. Then you are going to give them form B, read the colors from left to right, and then and you're going to time them for that, and that's and then you're going to combine the time. What the Arkansas Rapid Naming people want you to do is then take all of those scores of the kids that you have in a particular um, class and rank them so that you can see who are the low kids and who are the high kids. I, I kind of like to have the idea of what does a bad one look like? What's a good one look like? What's the numbers? So for weeks I've been searching, no, not weeks, last night I got, went down a rabbit hole again, looking for some benchmark scores. And you know, I don't, I don't know um, if this kind, of, this goes with it, like, but uh, Acadians had some scores where it, low risk was if you were less than 195, and um, at risk is if it took you more than 230 seconds to do it. Yes, you wouldn't do this with colorblind people. You could get another example um, like objects, um, and I think the objects, I think you probably have to really search for that. Objects, it has a key, you know, a door, a dog, whatever. Um, and I, we've been back and forth about home language. I would, home language, I would do it in the home language because what I, we have found that's really slow if you have to kind of go through the whole thing of think about, thinking about it in Spanish and then make it into English. So those are the two questions I have about the RAND test. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. When students make mistakes, that's at least the way we do mm -hmm. is if they make a mistake, then um, they're allowed one self-correction, and then after that, they're counted as mistakes. Is that correct? Is that right, right, mean? right. Okay. Um, it wasn't really a question. It was say if they um, have, um, they're allowed one self-correction, and then um, one self-correction, and then after that, it's, it's counted wrong. It's very telling if they're having to self-correct. It's very telling if they're making mistakes, okay? And you're just making sure that you keep an eye, eyeball on that, that kid because they're most likely gonna have issues with learning to read, so. All right, you don't need to get it out yet, but I'm going to teach you in just a moment the B checker. Um, let me give you a little history of the B checker. A lot of times, a lot of teachers, including myself, um, let me back up. 
many children get B's and D's confused, right? Um, and that's very typical that they get B's and D's confused when it is still occurring from mid second grade and on. That is very often a sign of um, dyslexia. It pretty much goes away when it's just a developmental issue by middle of second grade. Um, so anyway, a lot of teachers, as I said, including me, have used the bed. <laughs> um, you know, this is a B and this is a D. The problem with introducing both of them at the same time, particularly for those with dyslexia, is you still have both of them coming at them and they can't really discern them between them. I can't tell you how many years I taught this until I had a 17 year old student named Sam who I thought I was going to teach him the difference in B's and D's and he just looked at me and said and what's that supposed to do for me? <laughs> I was like Sam you are probably the first, you are, the first brave student has, who has said to me, that's not going to do me any good because you've got both, both symbols going. And so at which point I thought, all right, I need to find another way. Well, luckily I went to a, another position and at that position they had a wonderful idea for the checking. And what it is, we call it the B checker. You don't have to get it out now, but in a minute I will have you get it out. And the way the B checker works I am right-handed, so I'm going to use my non-dominant hand, my left hand, to check. And what I do is I put my finger on the stick, and if that ball or that circle fits on my thumb, then it's a B. So we call that the B. If I try this one with the word Okay, there's my finger on there, ball sits on it, must be a B. On the D, I still put my finger on the stick, there's no ball sitting here, must not be a B. I don't use the word D, just must not be a B, because when you use those two, again, it confuses them. Okay, finger goes on the stick, is there a ball sitting there? Yes, must be a B. Finger on the stick, no ball sitting there from the, that letter, must be a D. Does that make sense? Okay, you will find when you go, when I have you search through your supplemental deck, you will also find that there is a D in there. Um, there is such a thing as the D checker for the, the per people who are lefties, they use their right hand, must be a D. However, I caution you in the classroom setting to get both of those going on because it's just a little much. Even in my individual settings or when I have two or three students in a group, it's even a bit much for that. And this year I'm going to do a trial and just have everybody do the B and see if it doesn't go a lot smoother because it's just there always seems to be that question mark and it, it shouldn't be that confusing. And so I've decided it's because there's too many things coming at them. So when you get your, when you go to your supplemental deck, take this out and you'll also find a card like this that I also want you to take out simply because if I put my finger there on the stick, and there's a ball. I've also got this on it because the letters are so close together. Do you see what I mean? That's why I like this card best. So what you need to do is go to your supplemental deck and get out cards two and five.
So these will be the two that you'll have out. Nope, I'm wrong. Just kidding. <laughs> these will be the two that you have out. <laughs> Okay, and while you're finishing pulling those out, the supplementary deck is really filled with a lot of teacher tools. That's what's in that supplementary deck that you can use when instructing students. Okay, so for the sake of the people who got stuck in traffic out there, <laughs> which you couldn't really help, I'm going to go over it one more time. And I talked about how many teachers teach bed. This is a B and this is a D but it doesn't work for most kids because you're still giving them the two symbols of B and D at the same time. So we just teach the B checker and the way it works is you put your index finger on the stick and if the ball sits in your hand must be a B. Ball on the stick must be a B. Ball on this stick there's no B there must not be a B must be a B. Does it make sense everybody? Give me a thumbs up if it makes sense. Anybody need more explanation? Am I con you need more explanation? Okay. All right. I think it probably, let me do it this way. Okay, I think the reason that it seems hard is because they're going across. So that if I did it vertically, I put my index finger on the stick. There's a ball that sits there. Must be a B. Okay, I put my index finger on the stick. There's no ball that sits there. Not a B. Index finger on the stick. There's a ball. That's a B. Index finger on the stick, no ball, not a B. Index finger on the stick, there's a ball there, that's a B. Index finger on the stick, there's a ball there, that's a B. Does that help? Okay. I do think when they're so close it gets a little tricky, so you might want to do them in a vertical fashion. Okay, what we're going to do now, um, again these are the only two you need, but if you would prefer to write them going vertically like this, rather than, hor no, I guess this is okay like this. Anyway, it's up to you. Um, what I'm going to have you do is one of you be a teacher, and I want you to teach the B checker to your partner, and then after you've done that, then I want your partner to teach the B checker to you. It seems like such a simple thing, but it is amazing how it can kind of go south. <laughs> and Jamie and I will be around if you need more. Okay, so it's to the tune of Twinkle Twinkle. I use my hand to check and see if this letter is a B. Does the stick fit on the line? Does the bubble fit inside? I use my hand to check and see if this letter is a B. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> okay, thank you, Lacey. All right. Um, I had a question about how... How can we help the children know which hand to put up? Um, if they think of the paw here, that's very helpful. I have, however, had some severely dyslexic children that I had made little bracelets out of string for, 
or something of that nature so that the, until they got automatic at you at knowing which hand. Um, and I probably wouldn't point them out. I'd probably make them for everybody <laughs> um, until the students, you know, understood that that was the hand that they always put up. And then I had a great question from a group over here, and they said, well, what about the P? Well, if they, you put your hand here, yes, it does stick on here. Jamie said she's not really had very many children past kindergarten that struggle with this. I have a great nephew who's going into third grade that he still struggles with this. All right, this is not real um, polite, perhaps. <laughs> But it's one that will be remembered, and my teachers over here laughed at it and said, oh, sure, you can share that. Everybody will like it. I tell him, P's P down. <laughs> and he still has to think of that every single time. So anyway, all right. Any questions at home on the B checker? Any questions here on the B checker? Hey, the biggest takeaway is you don't want to talk about B's and D's because then it all gets raw. Just talk about your B's, okay? All right. Now what I want to do, you don't need to get these out yet, but um, we're going to ta start talking about sounds. Um, And it's very important when you do your sound deck, and I will show you when I finish this, where this goes in your lesson plan. You want to anchor your cards. You don't want them up in the air like this, because if they're up in the air, it's sometimes hard to hold them still. And so you're thinking about a person who struggles to read, and the position that the letter is in space starts changing when you start moving it. So anchoring it is really important. So I'm going to go through with you and do the sounds of the basic alphabet as well as um, the vowels. And um, I'm doing this because a lot of times we add extra sounds to the consonants and Sometimes we say a few of the letters incorrectly because no one ever taught us to say it correctly. So let's go. Can you all see this or not? Why don't I go ahead and put it on the document camera? But if you just make it a point when you're teaching it to um, anchor your deck. Okay. So we're just going to go through the sounds for this. J. And there is a rhyme on the back, or a rhyme that Lacey made. And it is, J is never an English word's last letter. So can you say that, please? J is never an English word's last letter. Okay, so let's do the two of them now. J. J, J. And then I'm going to do this for the rule. J, J is, is never an English word's last letter. Good job. Qua. And there's a rule for this one. Q and U are friends until the end. Can you say that? Q and U are friends until the end. Okay, let's go back and do the sound and the rule. Qua. Q and U are friends until the end. Good job. Mm -hmm. Last rule here. If the ending sounds like mm -hmm. Always add a magic E. Okay, let's put them together. Okay, good job. Now I'm going to go ahead and do the two sounds for this. You would not do this in the classroom if you hadn't taught short I. You would only be starting with short I. I, I. Oh. I'm going to tell you, some programs teach it as la. Um, and we've gone to the mat with a few people, but some people are very sure that it says la. 
I don't say I want a um, la emin. I say I want a lemon. So we do. We keep the tongue behind our teeth. Oh. Get up your finger, your hand, and prove it to me that it's a b. Good job. A u. A u. A a. And I love how Lacey put both A's on there. She thinks of everything, doesn't she? <laughs> mm. D. Prove it that it's not a B. Good job. <sighs> T. P. K. Z. A. O. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Kids have a really hard time with this, particularly those with dyslexia, because it says the k and the s sound. I used to say back in the day when bacon used to be cooked in a frying pan, it sounds like bacon sizzling in a frying pan, but not very many people know about that sound. Kids know about that sound anymore. So now I say when you open up a soda pop, it sort of sounds like the g. K. E. E. This is not r. I mean, this is not er. A lot of people think this is er. It's r. We teach it as a happy puppy and clop, clip off as much of that uh as you can. R. I had a teacher years ago taking my training, and she said, oh, I've taught first grade and kindergarten all these years, and I've always said, er, think of all those kids I've messed up. <laughs> she felt so guilty. She taught for 40-some years. I said, it's okay. Now you know it's rough, and you'll be working with new kids. <laughs> okay, we also have a card in here called vowel and consonant, and it's really important that the students are able to identify the vowels and identify the consonants because so much of the work that we do in OG depends upon whether a letter is a vowel or a consonant. So when we first start out, it's important to use that language with them. So the vowels are A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y, and everything else is a consonant. Um, I've had two different songs that I've used through the year. I am not the best singer in the world, <laughs> but I will give it a whirl. Um, the one goes to bingo. There are five letters in the alphabet, and they are called the vowels. A, E, I, O, U, A, E, I, O, U, A, E, I, O, U, and they are called the vowels, and sometimes why. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, one of our first grade teachers likes one, or has one that I really like, and one of my students taught it to me. And it's to learn the short sounds. It's A says A, ah, A, ah, E says E, eh, E, eh, I says I, 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 O says A, uh, A, uh, U says A, uh, A, uh, those, these are my vowels. Um, and I like that one because it also had the sounds with it, which I thought was great. So when you're going through this deck and you're saying, let's, let's just do a couple of these. Tell me the sound again. And the and the rule. No English word ends with J. With J. You pretty much said it. You just said it in a different way. J is never an English word's last letter. And then I would say, is this a consonant or a vowel? Mm-hmm. Okay. What are the two sounds for this? Is this a consonant or a vowel? Now I'm not going to say that on every single card because it would take too long to get through. But just to Put that in and, you know, inter intersperse it in there, I think, is important. Um, and then when I get to this card, I always do have them give me the names of the vowels. But just because they know the names of the vowels doesn't necessarily mean they know what the short sound is and what the long sound is. I've been working with a hardcore dyslexic for a couple of years, and she can rattle off A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. Okay, give me the short sound for A. A? <laughs> So you really have to work on getting that solidified as well. 
Okay, um, I want to show you the back of the cards. So when you get yours out, um, you will notice that on the back there are boxes here. These boxes tell us we're going to sort these cards into three piles as we're going through and doing the sounds. And this tells you which pile it's going to go in. If it's here, it's the first pile. If the letter is here, then it tells you the middle pile. You're going to put that in the middle pile. And when the letter can be, or grapheme can be in either pile, it's going to put it in those two spots. As Jamie said, if it's in two spots, put it in the last pile, because that pile usually comes up pretty short. Okay? Um, and you also notice there's a word on the back. Each one of these graphemes has a keyword. So if I were teaching the letter M says M, mm, I would tell the children, and its keyword is map, so that we're all using that same keyword. All of them have a different keyword on them. Um, this one has two, the short one and the long one. Um, and some people, instead of saying short sound, say it's sound, and they say th the long sound is its name. And I do find that that makes a lot more sense to children than short and long. The short is what's a letter sound, and the long is what's a letter's name. Um, okay, I also wanted to call your attention to, let's see. If you look in this book, um, the OG Educator's Guide, and turn to page 21. Okay, when we're talking about consonants, let me go over a few of those bullet points there. There's the 21 consonants, and they rarely say their names. X does say X in X-ray or in Xerox when it's the first letter in a word. But other than that, consonants rarely say their name. Um, and most of them have one primary sound. Um, like when I gave you the C, I had you make the K sound. It also says S, like in city. Um, so some of them have secondary sounds, which we'll talk more about as the week goes on. Um, we've already talked about how the letter R says, R says R. And we talked about Q, U, and J, and V. All right, what I'd like to talk about now is the voiced versus the unvoiced sounds. If you say the sound d and say the sound t, I want you to say d and then t and see what your mouth is doing. Go ahead and do those. Say them out loud. D, t, d. Is it doing something pretty similar? It is. Um, and so what we have to think about for students who have difficulties with that, because we can't really tell them that their mouth is doing something different and showing them what their mouth looks like, should look like. We talk about voiced and unvoiced. So take your hand and put it over your voice box here. And if it rattles, it's called a voice sound. So say D. Is that voiced? Yep, our, our voice box was rattling. Now say T. Does it rattle on t? It does not, because that's an unvoiced sound that does not use our voice box to produce it. So that is one way you can explain the difference, even though your mouth isn't doing anything different. Same thing for the V and the F. Say, do the V and the F sound. Mm -hmm. Your lips are together on both of those, aren't there? The only difference is the voiced versus the unvoiced. Tell me which one is voiced, the V or the F. Try it because mm, you hear that. So I'm not going to go through all of those, but the reason these are highlighted here is because the mouth and the teeth and the tongue are doing very, very similar things 
And when we teach children new sounds, we often talk about what is your mouth doing. But in these, the mouth is similar, so you have to talk about is it voiced or unvoiced. Do you feel that voice box rattling or not? Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Any questions at home, Lacey? Nope. Okay. Okay, the next sounds I want to teach you are digraphs. And a digraph is two letters that come together to make one sound. So two graphemes, or two letters, so I have my SH, but they make one sound. That's their phoneme. Here I have the TH, two letters or two graphemes, but they make one sound. They actually make a voice sound and an unvoiced sound. They say and th. And then the CH, another digraph, ch. And the PH and WH. Okay, so here are our digraphs. Let's say these together. Everybody? Love to tell kids, it's the only time you can stick your tongue out and get away with it. <laughs> because their tongue is sticking out when they say this sound. And shh. Okay. So those are our basic consonants and vowels and our five digraphs. Now, what I want to show you before we do our partner practice is our lesson plan template, just to help you see where this goes. Now again, all OG trainings will put these different components of the training in different places. doesn't matter as long as you do them all and you do it with um, visual auditory and kinesthetic. This is just the way we teach it. So all lesson plans start out with a visual drill, which is where you show a card, you tap to prompt, so you, they, you know, if it's one consonant with one sound, I'm tapping once. If it's the vowels, I'm tapping twice and the student says the sounds, and then the teacher separates them into three piles. So this is the very, very first thing that we do. And the reason you're separating them into three piles is getting them set up for the blending drill. Okay, there is a whole lot. Pardon me? It will be in our next printing, but you will be getting an email of it <laughs> tonight, as a matter of fact, okay? <laughs> Great question. Um, that we just came up with last week. <laughs> All good teachers are constantly changing things, are we? Um, okay, so what I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about the visual drill. So if you turn in your OG, actually, I'm not going to do it with this book. This book puts it in a paragraph form when it talks about um, the Am I having a troubles again? This one puts it in a paragraph form when I'm talking about the visual drill. And what I prefer is to put it like in a number because I think it's easier that way. So if you would turn in your supplemental documents to page 81. So this book, page 81. Okay, 
So up here at the top where it says visual drill procedure, you show the card just as I did and you put one finger because it only says one sound and then the student says back wha. Um, so we just did those three steps right there. Teacher shows the card, teacher taps the card, student gives the sound. And then if there is a rhyme, like the short vowel pointers, which we haven't learned yet, or for J, Q, U, and V, you give that rhyme. So um, if, I sh if I did the J, we would say, I'm tapping, everybody say J. And then the rhyme is, J is never in English words last letter. Okay? All right. And then you separate them into the three piles according to the squares on the back. Did we want to separate when we first do the blending drill today? I mean the visual drill. It's kind of a lot to think about, isn't it? Okay. Um, all right. Let's say the student makes a mistake. Let's say they come to this letter and they don't tell you J. The first thing you want to do is you want to give them time because sometimes they just need that wait time, as we know, the processing time. If that doesn't work, then have them trace the letter on a rough surface, um, either sandpaper. Some teachers last week came up with the idea of sandpaper. Um, this is shelf paper that has texture in it, um, which is nice for all kids to have one of those. There's also gel bag images or gel bags that you can make, which Jamie or Lacey will tell you more about those in a moment. Um, there's also this embroidery board that you can use. Um, it's just nice if you can have some sort of texture that they can feel. Sometimes I bring bricks from home too and I have them do it on the brick. Or if you don't have any of those available, they can skywrite it. Skywriting is done with their dominant hand. Um, and I'm going to turn my back to you so I'm modeling it the correct way. I'm a righty, so I'm going to use these two fingers on my right hand. I'm going to keep my arm nice and straight. This is my marker, and as Lacey says, I take my lid off my marker and I put it right here. And we go, J says, and many times that will bring it back. J. It's just like magic for the kids. It's really important to keep your elbow straight, though. First, I want you to sky right and have a wimpy elbow, what I call just a really loose elbow, and do a J. Now, keep it nice and straight. Use those two fingers. Which one do you feel more up here? The straight, right? Now try it with your eyes closed. Does that even give sometimes some of you a better image in your brain with your eyes closed? Some people it does. Okay, so anyway, what you want to do, we talked earlier this morning about the kinesthetic piece is the glue that holds it together. So if they don't know that J says J and you just say J, you're going to be saying J for a very long time <laughs> because it's not going to stick. That's the kinesthetic piece that we talked about earlier today that really helps it get into the brain. So you want them to do something. Either it's skyrite, which is as simple as can be, or a textured surface of some sort. Um, then, if that still doesn't work, you ask them for the keyword. Well, when I taught the letter J, I told them the keyword was jam. So they say jam. What does J say in J am? And if they can't tell you, then you just give them the sound. And if you get to the point where you have to give them the sound, they really need to skywrite that or write that on a textured surface three times. J says J. J says J. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm going to demonstrate the whole visual drill to you. And again, this is the first thing we do in the lesson plan. Um, we're just going to go through the whole thing, and then afterwards, you're going to practice it with your partner. Okay, everybody. Sound? Rule? Oh, hang on. Rule? Great. 
Oh, what's the rule? <laughs> That's right. That's right. Okay, here we go. Good job. A tongue behind the teeth. Prove it to me. Good job on getting those bee checkers out. All right, I'm going to be you for a minute, and I'm going to say, mmm, for this one, okay? I'm going to make a mistake so I can demonstrate the error correction. Okay, let's look at this letter. Well, wait a minute, give you time. Okay, that didn't bring it up. All right, get out your skywriting fingers. Get those two fingers out straight, and I want you to skywrite this letter and say it as you do it. Or do you can just say, N says, now we're going to pretend like you didn't say N because you still had that question mark over you, okay? So my next step is I'm going to say, well, what is your keyword? And you would say, oh, nest. How do I know the keyword is the teacher? It's on the back, and I gave it to them when I taught it. What sound is the N making nest? Mm, okay, good. Would you skywrite that for me a couple times? Good job. Okay. Get your checkers out and prove it to me. Good job. You guys are good at your sounds. And let's try that again. Unvoiced. And uh, happy puppy. Let's try that again. Okay, name me the vowels. And what is everything else in the alphabet called? Right. Good job. Okay. Any questions on this so far? Any questions at home? They want to hear the sounds again? Okay. All right. Never hurts to do the sounds. Too we can't do it too many times. Now, you notice that I put these um, ones with rules together. I did that purposefully because sometimes when you're learning rules, it's easier if you have three in a row that you're learning the rules for and you know that has the rules. We want to have them take out their Not yet. Okay. Not that we're just going to practice. Somebody on Zoom wanted the sounds again. Okay. I do have a question. Sure. So Yes. Okay. Excellent. Yes. We're just starting, as, as we teach you the different rules that go with why they say different sounds, then we'll start doing the Sorry, different sounds. Can you say that question again? Um, the question was um, that, for those of you on Zoom, that, thank you, Lacey, that um, is there a point, since some of the consonants do make two sounds, for example, C says K and S, at what point do we start tapping for that second sound? Um, we tap for the second sound after we teach them the why. It says, S, and we will do that for you here as well after we've taught you the letters that it says after. Okay, so one more time um, through the sound deck. Everybody? Should. Rule? Can you, can you say it? Because the people at home can't hear them, so can you say the sound as well? Sure. Yeah. 
Okay. J. Rural. J is never an English word's last letter. Qua. I Oh, keep the tongue behind the teeth. Oh, you already told me this was b, but prove it to me. Good job. A U A A D. Show me, and that's. Not to be good. T. P. K. Z. A. O. Y. K. G. And name me the vowels. A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. And everything else in the alphabet is A. Good job. Okay. All right. Um, when I finish talking, I'm going to have you get out. From your basic blending deck, um, 1 to 26, and you will know it's that because it only has a number on the back. It does not have S with it. 1 to 26, as well as 27 to 31. So basically, 1 to 31 you need to get out. Okay, on Zoom, um, if you would, Lacey's going to go over the procedure with you again, and you will practice in your breakout rooms. Okay, can I just finish giving directions here to all of us? After you get out cards 1 to 31, you're going to get with a partner. One of you is going to be the teacher, and you're going to do the sound pack. It's what we call that, the visual drill. Don't worry about separating it into piles right now. You've got too much to think about. We'll do the pile sorting the next time around, okay? Um, so just go through, give the rule, have them prove the B. Be sure that you are anchoring the deck so that it's not moving up in the air. So one of you give it, and then the other one practice with cards 1 to 31, okay? We are going to go into partner practice for 15 minutes, and then we're going to have a 15-minute break. Okay, hey everybody. Um, I have, there were a couple quick questions in chat I wanted to address super quick before we go to practice. Um, there was no, no rhyme or reason to the order that Christy had her cards in. We just typically recommend that you mix up the order so kids don't get used to saying ah, a, ah, b, k. You know what I mean? Have them in order, then they just memorize the order and they're not really thinking about it. So we will get more into the order of um, when to teach different sounds later this week, and we're going to talk about how to use data to drive that decision. Um, before that, I wanted to point out a couple things. Um, like on the cards like the J and the QU, a lot of these, you know me, a lot of these have little rhymes or little sayings, little mnemonic devices to remember. Um, she had hers covered up with a post-it note for some reason, but the rules are all right here. So if you're thinking, oh no, I didn't write that down, don't panic, they're all right here. And the cards that we're using are the, is, this is the basic blending deck, so everybody should have this. If you don't, make sure you say it in the survey at the end of the day. So basically, when you have your cards, if you're not using a document camera, I keep, I tilt it a little bit, so you can see from the side, I tilt it a little bit so I can have a little cheat sheet on the back of what the keyword is in case I need it. So then you're just gonna go through the sounds. We don't go through the letter names, you're just gonna go through the sounds for the visual drill, so it sounds like this. A, A, B. 
D. E. E. Does that make sense? Um, type in chat if you want me to go through everything real quick. I'm just looking, looking at my computer over here. Do you want me to go through every 1 to 31, or are you ready to go to breakout rooms? Oh, somebody said the little boxes. No, so the, the boxes on the back are actually for the blending drill, which, which we're going to get in tomorrow. So don't even stress about the boxes on the back yet. Just focus on the sound and going through. That's all you're worried about. Cards one. Okay, lots of good questions came up here um, in the room as well as on Zoom. And one comment is some people particularly over there are having a hard time hearing me. If at any point anyone in the room can't hear me, do this. Turn up that volume, okay? <laughs> because there's nothing worse than being in a room and not being able to be hear someone. Okay, so one of the questions was on this card. Um, where are the rhymes? The rhymes I had covered up, but they are right here on each card. I just have them covered up because I'm learning new rhymes this, in this training, and so I have them covered up for myself in bigger writing. Um, and then um, one of my teachers over here, I think it was you, Kelly, brought up that this rule might, you might want to edit this rule because it says if the ending sounds like mm -hmm. always add a magic E. Well, she pointed out that in the word, Kelly pointed out, it doesn't necessarily have to be a magic E because if I have... The word, this word as we know, can be pronounced two ways. It can be live or it can be live. In live, when it's short, when it's long, when it says its name, it is a magic E. We still have an E on this word in live when it's a red word. And a red word means a, a word that doesn't follow the rules. That magic E is not on there to make the I say I. So if you want to mark out um, that it has to be a magic E and just put it, it has to have an E, that's fine. Um, and as Lacey said, if you want to come up with your own rhymes that might make more sense to your brain, that's fine as well. Um, and very importantly, I think particularly it, it would, in the ideal world, it would be nice if across the grade level, if you, if you make up your own rhymes, that you all agree on the rhymes, um, just so that, you know, kids don't get confused. There's enough confusion out there as it is. Okay, so that was one. Another one was, as you noticed, you have what I call your fair deck. And what I mean by a fair deck is every sound in that deck that you um, were going through with your partner, you now, it is assumed by us that you now know how to pronounce all of those. So that's a fair deck because we very quickly with you as teachers went over those sounds because we knew you knew most of them. Um, with children, we will not move anywhere close to that. Speed. So, for example, I'm going to show you a couple scope and sequences. Let me show you this one first. This is in your manual on page 59, this manual. If you want to turn to page 59. Um,
this is one sample scope and sequence. There are a lot of scope and sequences out there. This particular scope and sequence starts with the letter M. So there would be absolutely nothing in that student's deck if that's where you were beginning with the letter M. The first card that you would be putting in there is the letter M when you are teaching them the sound that M says and the keyword for M and having them write it and put it on textured paper or some sort of a textured surface. That's called introducing a new phoneme grapheme. We will get to that later this week and give you the very specific steps to do to introduce something, a new um, sound to children. But then on the next lesson, notice they are teaching short A. Okay, so now your deck would have, the child's fair deck would have the M that you taught before, and then after you have specifically taught the A says ah for its sound, you would now have two cards in your deck. And somebody asked about how do you know when you're going to tap that A twice? Well, if you look down here, I don't teach long A for quite some time. So I'm not going to teach, they're not going to tap it twice until I get all the way over to page 62 when I'm teaching the long vowels as an open syllable at the top on 62. So that's when that card would be tapped twice. So there's quite a bit of, quite a few lessons in between there before you're tapping that twice. Does that clarify things for those in the room? How about on Zoom? No questions yet. No questions yet, okay. Okay, um, now, how do you know where to start? Everybody's not going to, if you use that set scope and sequence, obviously every student and every class that you start with is not going to start with a letter M. <laughs> we will teach you later on this week, um, actually on Thursday, an assessment so that you can figure out what your students know and then you'll, you'll figure out from there, okay, so which lesson plan do I start in? Does that make sense, more sense? Okay. But because we have so much to teach you in just four days, we're throwing a lot of things at you way faster than we would a student. Okay? All right. Um, uh, when do we introduce the keyword? For example, if I were teaching that Q, you said qu, when would I introduce the keyword, which is written on the back, quilt? When I teach that sound, I would introduce the keyword. Q, you says qu, like in quilt. What's my keyword? Qu. So right now, I'm just kind of going over that very generally for you. But when I teach you, or when one of us teaches you how to teach a phoneme grapheme or a new letter sound, we will go through it very slowly and methodically. I'm just kind of giving you the big picture now. Does that make sense? Okay. I think I have answered all the questions, unless some more have surfaced as I've talked. Have any more surfaced in anyone's head? Are we good? Okay. All right. You will notice when I, when we did the blending drill, um, deck, or the visual drill, and we had the letter Q-U, you did not say the letter names. You just, you just looked at this and said qua, right? I, I, you only said the sounds. So when you're using these smaller cards, these are typically for older, little older students. Like I start with the, these cards second semester of first grade, typically. Um, you're just, it's already assumed that they have had enough practice with those letters at that time that they don't need to continue to say the letter name. But for very beginning readers, and again, that might not just be first grade. For example, Jamie worked with some teachers this summer 
um, and there were third, fourth, and fifth graders because it was uh, um, they were English language learners and they did not know their letters. So they were using what we call the picture deck for that because they needed those pictures. So, and they also did not know necessarily the name of each letter because they were ELL students even though they were older. So you have to look at the student in front of you. I'm saying a typical student, I would not be using this with from middle of first grade on. But as we know, there are lots of students that don't fit into those typical um, molds. This is what we call the picture deck. And this is for the students who are in the process of learning the letter name as well as the sound. Again, I'm going to throw all of these at you at once. But if I was using a sample, the same sample um, sequence, I would begin, I can't find my letter right now, but with a letter M. And that would be the only card that would be in their deck as I teach that. It wouldn't be near as fat as yours is. Okay? All right. So if you turn to page 86 in your supplemental documents, I will go over the procedure with you for doing this drill when using the picture cards. Okay, so the first step is, I pretty much already talked about that, you're going to make your deck by putting in the cards that the students came to you knowing or that you have directly taught them. If they don't know anything, you're starting at the very beginning. Okay, so you would show the card to them and you would say, this is the letter U. And then the student would skywrite, now oh, wait a minute, three times, if I was teaching them the sound, they would skywrite it three times, um, that U says, uh, like an up. And then um, I would tell them the keyword, which is up. And then at the end, they say the letter name keyword and finally the sound. So we're just going to practice knowing the, the sound for now. So what we do with this one is we say K, kite, k. Don't let this bird distract you. The only reason that bird is on there is because the illustrator thought it would be really cute. <laughs> Some people in our last training thought, oh, is that a cardinal? But that doesn't begin with a K, that begins with a C. So that's just a cute little bird on there. That doesn't go really with the keyword. Um, so if you were doing the regular drill, you would just say K. The students would just say K. But on the picture drill, they're going to say K, kite, K. So they say the letter name, the keyword, and the sound. Okay? So let's go through these and do this together. K, kai, k. D, dog, d. N, nest, n. O, octopus, ah. P, pig, p. S, snake, T, turtle, t. W, wagon, w. V, van, v. Good job clipping that. X, box, x. Y, yawn, y. Excuse me, I did that wrong. <laughs> y, yawn, y. Z, zebra, z. L, lamp, o. Good olds. A, apple, a. I, this is an itch. I, itch, i. I see. See a itch in there? <laughs> R, rat, r, C, cat, k, G, goat, g, H, 
Pat, J, Jam, J, M, Ma, M, E, Edge, F, B, Bat, B, F, Fish, Q, U, Quilt, U, Up, Uh. Okay, so notice you do say the letter name because if you're using this picture deck, it's very, they don't know, they're not that familiar with the letter names yet. So that's part of the reason you do the letters. With, that is the reason you do it. Okay, I also want to show you about the vowels. The vowels are the most important, well, I shouldn't say the most important, they're all important. But they're very important, and so we have um, signals to go with these. Okay, so when we're teaching that O says ah, the signal, the hand signal that we use is when we say ah, we make a nice O with our mouth. That hand signal, again, is the kinesthetic piece that helps them remember it. So let's do O, ah, excuse me, O, octopus, ah. Okay, for the apple, the key word is like we're going to take a bite of an apple. Ah. So, A, A, A. The I is the itch, and the key word is this, or this hand signal is this. So, this is I, itch, I. And for E, it's the edge of a table. So, it's E, edge, Eh. And for you, it's up. You, you up, up, uh. Okay, let's do those one more and let's everybody practice the hand signals, okay? You, up, uh. E, edge, edge. Uh. I, I, itch, itch. A, apple, a. Thank you. A, apple, a. O, octopus, a. So we want those sign hand signals to definitely be done with the vowels. Okay, now, what I do with mine? The picture deck. is 1 to 31 as well. So you're going to take out 1 to 31 and you're going to do a partner practice with that. And 1 to 31 also includes the digraphs, which are two consonants coming together to make one sound. So you'll pull all of those. I didn't go over those sounds again. And then one person will be the teacher, and you'll try to be a better teacher than me, and you'll say the sounds, the names first, W-H, whistle, wha, okay, with your picture deck. was um, for QU, when we're teaching QU, we say QU quilt qua. The two letters have to go together. QU.
Um, one thing that one of our teachers here in the room noted, which is an excellent observation, is that on page 59 in the sample scope and sequence, some of the um, keywords are different. And that's true, they are. Um, Lacey made her keywords up totally separate from the sample scope and sequence. So you will notice that some of those are different. Since you're using these cards, I would just swap out and use the keyword that's on the back of your cards rather than adding in another keyword on whichever scope and sequence you end up going with. Um, also, another question that came up was on the SH one on the um, picture deck. This one is kind of redundant, whereas with PH, we would say PH phone on this one. The panda is actually making the sh sound, so you're going to say SH so you're going to do it twice, the SH sound, because that the keyword involves the SH sound. Okay, we use, just a, another reminder, we only have to say the letters when using this deck, because this is our students who are the ones that you're using this with, or your students who are still at the novice level, or maybe even very novice, and just learning what letters they are. So that's why we say the letters, whereas by the time we get to this deck, the letters are automatic, and so they don't need to say V. It's just because you want that visual drill to go pretty quickly. So big takes longer, little it's shorter, just the sound. Okay? Were there other questions, or were you going to address those? No, I don't think there was other questions. Okay. Yeah. Any questions out here? No? All right. We promised you you'd have a little bit more activity in the afternoon. Are we keeping our promise? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, we have already talked about the diagraphs. And um, the, the um, prefix di means two, and the diagraphs are sh, ch, TH, PH, WH, two letters but only one sound. That's the diagram. I'm going to go on to talk to you about blends. And um, before I do that, um, I'm going to talk to you about finger spelling because it kind of goes along with the blends. Finger spelling is actual. Um, an actual phonemic awareness activity, but when you're teaching spelling, using the um, finger spelling is a way for them to practice their segmenting. And when, when you begin in, to teach them how to finger spell, you really don't have them do any writing right away. You're just having them uh, segment. You want to go from left to right. Last week I said right to left, but that was really wrong. So you're going to, if you are um, a kid that is right-handed, you want to start with your non-dominant hand and the, and the other way around. This is on, um, I think it's on uh, OG, the OG book, page 22, where there's information about finger spelling. And what you're going to have them do is you're going to have them segment the sound, you're going to give them a word, they're going to repeat the word, and then they're going to segment the sounds. Okay? Here is an example. I'm going to start with cat. I would say, class, the word is cat. What is the word? Cat. And you want them to give it back to you so you can make sure that you're saying it right. I have a student that oftentimes doesn't get the ending sound, and I would say, stand. And she would say, Stan. She would give me back Stan. I said, listen again, stand. You say it. And I have her repeat it back. The word is cat. Now you're going to finger spell. K -a -t. OK? So they're just tapping one sound on each finger. This is important to know that um, when you do a diagraph, since it's one sound, the diagraph goes on one finger. 
class, the word is ship. What is the word? Ship. Let's tap it. Sh-i-p. Okay? Now, you are going to say to me, I have little kids that are not going to be able to do this kind of tapping. And I understand that. Maybe they're, they have, um, um, especially little kids, that they're just, I, have a, I have a kid that can never do his pinky, that he just starts right here. Okay, the whole idea is to have that kinesthetic feedback when you're putting one sound on each finger. Some people go like this. Okay, where they tap the finger with the thumb for each sound. Some people, especially um, in Zoom learning, is I let the kids do it up here so I can see what they're doing because they always, I really actually only see like uh, eyes above half the time. So put it up here so I can see that they're actually tapping or moving their finger for each sound. One sound on each finger. So that, like I said, diagraphs go on one finger. If I have the word, this is one of my favorites, for instance, the word eight. Class, what's the word? Eight. Eight. Even though it's five letters, it's two sounds. Okay, E-I-G-H says A. T. Okay. That I'm just, I'm just kind of giving you the idea that when you fingerspell, that they learning that a phoneme, and it's really both basically phoneme, graphing, matching. Okay, now I'm going to kind of go on to blends because this is an important piece of the blends. Blends are not one sound. They're either two or three sounds. We can kind of get into a discussion and I, I kind of, people get very technical about what a cluster is. Um, we're going to say cluster is three letters. Okay. So we do have blends that um, are in your box. It's very nice because the blends are this lovely um, periwinkle color, I would say. Kind of bluish. Those are all the blends that you're going to need. Um, go ahead, and I'm going to have you take out the blends, which are the periwinkle color. They're also one, number 102 to 138. You can go ahead and rubber band those. We're not going to put these into your working deck yet, but we're going to talk about them. 102 to 138, all of the lovely periwinkle cards. Remember, these are not one sound. They maintain their sounds. They're they're little personalities, and you can hear both sounds in when you are saying the blends. And so you're going to have to put them on two fingers. I've been at some trainings where they say you can put the blends on one finger. It makes me shudder. But that's okay. I mean, and it's just kind of my thing, but if you want to do it, that's okay, and I'm not going to say anything against it. But I think it's important for them to recognize that there are two s different sounds put together. You need to teach the blends um, directly for kids who really struggle. You can't just think, well, they know the B, B sound and the L sound, so they should know the blend. Below. They, 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 You've got to teach them directly. They'll want for the kids that really struggle. Okay, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit. Anyway, when you have three letters that are a blend, we ca we're going to call that a cluster. S-T-R, um, S-C-R, S-P-L, S-P-R. Um, did I get STR? Okay, so those are called clusters. It isn't important. 
very important except for on the little quiz this afternoon. Three letters, okay? Well, also, we're going to say that when we have a diagraph that becomes a blend like THR and SHR, uh, SHR we're going to call that a cluster too, okay? You're not going to really have to teach this to kids. It just confuses them, but just let you know this happens. Those are the blends. They maintain their personality all the way through. Um, I th I'm going to tell you when you are teaching this, you probably want to st start with uh, the ST blend. Um, L's are, L blends are easier than R blends. I usually do R blends later because of just, just because of R. It's a, it's a difficult sound and it, it, it messes up um, their little brains. So I do R blends later. Um, these two R blends are particularly difficult. And I think if we look at some first grade teachers and kindergarten teachers, um, if he had the DR blend in the word dream, they often say dream, JR. How many? Um, and then it goes ahead that Drew Holiday plays for the Phoenix Suns and he spells his name with a JR. So um, the other one is TR and train would be train, like a CH, train. Um, so you, you have to make it very clear. They get it pretty soon. But if you have a kindergarten or first grader, th that's very confusing. Those R blends are confusing. What I'm going to have you do now is we're going to go through and we're going to fingerspell some words that have blends. So you can get the idea that the blends, each sound, each letter has its own sound, and it's going to be on different finger fingers. <coughs> All right, class, the first word is stop. What's the first word? Stop. Very good. Let's finger spell it. Stop. Ah. Very good. That's very good. Now the next one is flap. Say it. Flap. Flap. Ooh. Very good. Let's do swim. 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 Very good. The next one is going to be grip. Say it. Grip. We're going to go g-r-i-p. Let's do it together. G-r-i-p. Very good. And the next one is going to be an ending blend. That will really confuse you. Wilt. Say it. Wilt. W-i-l-t. The next word is jump. 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 Anytime you have a uh, M or an N, it's difficult, and I will tell you why. When the M and N is formed, the sound comes out of your nose. If you make the M sound mm, and plug your nose, it cuts it off. So they don't feel, they don't get that. Um, feedback in their mouth of what their mouth's doing. It's almost entirely coming out of your nose that you have to realize that that for some kids it's very difficult. Um, I used to have a child that every time I would say try that again he would say oh there's an M in it isn't it? <laughs> and um, you know it's easy to kind of figure out what the M and, and I, we have a student that that I've worked with who confuses when to write an M and when to write an N and we say with the M, your two lips go together so it has two humps. So that's an example, uh, a little something that, that you give a kid to help them remember something like that. Um, all right, does anybody have any questions about blends or finger spelling? Okay, yes. Um, does Spelling change when you get into multisyllable words or compound words, and how do you kind of coach okay. them to overcome that? Hurdle? Okay. The, they said, does finger spelling change when you get to multisyllable words or compound words? And it does. There's a way to teach that. What day do we do? Okay. I, I'm trying to remember what day I do. 
multi-syllables with. Later. <laughs> coming soon. Coming soon. <laughs> okay. There's a way to do it. Yes. One other. Sure. Um, do you have like any helpful hints for when you're teaching students finger spelling with the silent e at the end? Okay. This is not spelling. This is sounds. Okay. So I would not use spelling or finger spelling if I was having students read a word. I would only do it for sounds. Sounds. Oh. Okay. And, and let's just say the word was um, same, and you would finger spell and go s a m, mm. and then you would say, "What's that second sound? It's a. Wonder why it's an a? Oh, there's a magic e. Okay, and so that when you write it, then you know to put the e down. Okay. Okay. You guys are on it. You're thinking ahead. Yes, I'm just showing you how, you how you introduce it. Yes, we'll be doing lots more finger spelling. Um, with almost all of my kids still that I'm doing um, tutoring, they, we do finger spelling every time when we're doing spelling, okay? They finger spell and then they write it, okay? But I was t teaching how you to teach finger spelling, okay? Okay. So hey everybody, my name's TJ. Um, You'll get to know me pretty well. So the way it works is uh, there are 46 PGP points available throughout this training. Now, let me say up front, you do not have to do it all this week, okay? We had some people try to panic and get 46 hours worth of work done in one week. I don't want you to do that, okay? Please go home and spend a little bit of time with your families. Now, there are three components. This week's training is going to be 24 of those hours, all right? Now, you need 20 hours on a practice log. In your day one homework attachment, you'll see um, they'll, they're asking you to keep a log of your hours. Uh, this does not mean you have to videotape yourself. It's just kind of honor system. Uh, you can round it off to the nearest quarter hour. It needs to total 20 hours. Four of those hours come from this week's training. Okay, so you can just mark like day one training, one hour, however you need to to get those four hours for being present at this training, and then 16 hours need to come on your own. It is preferred that you do work with a child for those 16 hours, but if you can't, it's understandable. You can make note that you worked with someone else in your family or a neighbor or um, whichever that is. Like I know today you're not working with a child, <laughs> right? You're working with each other. Uh, so 24 plus 16, uh, we are now at 40, right? And the last six are coming from what is called armchair chats. Um, as Dr. Hill mentioned earlier in the morning, this is funded through the state of Indiana. And for that reason, they ask us to cover certain topics. Five of those topics, we just didn't want to add another day. And we wanted you to be able to go in a little deeper with them. So uh, there are five videos posted. They'll be in my end of day announcement. For each of the five videos, uh, just to show that you watch them, write down five to ten key points. We're not looking for anything specific, just something that shows engagement and understanding. Five to ten key points plus two or three sentences on how you can use it in your classroom. Okay, uh, so that's those five videos plus the notes will equal six hours of training, kind of that sixth day that we're not doing in person. Or sorry, fifth day that we're not doing in person, those six hours. Okay, now um, again, you do not need to get this done by this Friday, okay? I had someone last week go home and get like all the videos done in one night, it was crazy. No, please don't. You are strongly encouraged to finish by Labor Day, but if you don't, that's fine. My phone, or uh, you can text me or email me at any point if you have any questions, and if I can't answer it, I will definitely forward your message on to someone else who can help better than I can, all right? So uh, everything is going to be submitted by Qualtrics, okay? Now, you may not have heard of Qualtrics before, um, but it's pretty straightforward. You just get a link. Today, the link is just all multiple choice questions. Uh, just make sure you're paying attention today. And that's actually how we'll track the attendance for the people who are attending online. So it's fine if you're watching on Zoom with a group, but please don't take the quiz as a group. Don't project the quiz. Have each person take the quiz individually, okay? So four quizzes. For the four days, that'll be your attendance. 
uh, and then the log will be uploaded again on Qualtrics. You'll open up a link and there'll be a place to upload a file, kind of like you were attaching an email, attaching something to an email. Um, just it'll be easier to find for us in Qualtrics. Qualtrics has it all organized nice. <laughs> uh, so the practice log and the um, armchair chats will be uploaded there and then all of your quizzes, they'll just come in announcements at the end of the day. Now, if you are not getting my emails, they're getting forwarded to you for some reason, that means you're either not on my master list or my things are getting caught in spam, all right? When something has a lot of links and it's going to a lot of people, especially school email accounts love to trap it in spam, okay? So if something's going on, please do not hesitate to email me or text me and I will try my best to get that information to you directly so you don't have to worry about playing telephone with your colleagues. Okay, I think I hit everything. Was that all 46 hours? Awesome, thank you guys. You guys have a nice evening. Thank you for being so attentive and smart. We'll see you tomorrow.